Okay. It's coming. It's coming. I think it's working. There's a little red thing in the corner of my screen, everyone. For those of you guys that are watching this in cyberspace right now, cyberspace, that's a word we haven't used since, what, 2002? Cyberspace, remember that one? That was everywhere. Um, but anyway, hello, everyone. Um, we are blessed. We had 13 people already in the door as soon as we opened it up. So hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're going to real gently, we're going to very, very gently with this strange piece of burning wood here, we're just going to cauterize. Ooh, that's an interesting choice of words, right? We're going to cauterize our energetic environment here. Or maybe we're going to sanitize it a little bit. But anyway, come on in, everybody. I'm going to instantly click over to Facebook. For those of you all that know me, you'd know my, 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 my constant love affair with Facebook. It's a beautiful thing. We're going to click over there. Boom, there it is. Let's go public on Facebook. Guess what, guys? We're going public. Okay, so Facebook has allowed us in, and the journey begins. Hello, everyone. So I don't know how. I don't know how this keeps going. I think it's been about two weeks since we did our last one, so hello once again. Welcome to the School of Multidimensional Intuition. You did make it. That means that if you're viewing this video right now, whether it's after the fact, whether it's here on the live moment, congratulations, you are on the correct timeline. I mean that very sincerely. You are on the correct timeline and you've made it into this now moment here. I think the year is still, I think it's still 2022. And as far as I can tell, <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's June of 2022, which I mean, oh my God, you guys, how, how, how did it happen so fast? You know, I remember them saying that for a lot of us that are in, bitter old adult ages now you will remember them telling you when you were a kid they were like the years just get shorter and time just goes faster i remember older people telling me that when i was like 10 years old and i was like what yeah right it takes forever and here we are you know i'm in the, the we'll, we'll call it the fourth decade of my human experience and i'm like oh my god it's already june and not only that it's june 4th um and so anyway thanks for being here what's up sarah um how's it going Carla, what's happening? Cassandra, good to see you again. Cheryl, Brandon Beckelheimer, whoa, what's up? Thanks for showing up. Thanks for showing up. We got gold in the house. What's happening? Janie Rand, all right. LVC73, ooh, what's, what's the meaning behind those cryptic screen names? Anyway, thanks, thanks for showing up here, you guys. I want to say thank you to all of the like hundreds of subscribers that we, I think we had over 600 subscribers after our last show. Maybe that's a lot. It's probably a minor blip in the world of YouTube. They're like, what? I lose 600 subscribers daily. But anyway, we had over 600 subscribers here uh, just from our last show. And so if you're one of those people that kind of, you know, has just connected with us here in this strange multidimensional realm, welcome. Thanks for showing up. I think at this moment, you guys, right now on YouTube, I think we are about, I want to say we're about 40 people away from hitting 5,000. So if anyone wants to help this channel get to the next stage here, please do subscribe if you have not done so already. I say this in every show, so it's kind of a cringe statement now. Everyone else can turn off their audio for the next five seconds. But you should subscribe now because the second I say one thing you don't like, you can unsubscribe and you can get this cathartic release from canceling me from your experience so you, you know you can just use me as like a whipping boy later on and just unsubscribe later but for now if you're one of the viewers that's watching please subscribe to this channel as you're going to help us get to 5,000 subscribers not that that matters i've never been a person that courts social media numbers in my entire life so i feel a little bit kind of embarrassed kind of pumping that but i would like to see it get to that stage who knows, maybe one day they'll let us on Coast to Coast AM or some really cool show. But anyway, in the meantime, thanks for showing up. Thanks for showing up. Hello, Geraldine Heal. Heal? I think I got your last name right. But anyway, all right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna get down to business. This this week um is a very, very interesting guest. Uh, Mr. Eric J. Hecker, who uh, is a person that I have met and spent time with in the physical real world. So I can I can very much assure you that he is a he's a physical being. He's a real person. And um, Eric is one of the people that when I started this strange show, as soon as I started it, a bunch of people started hitting me up to kind of come on the show, which was one of the things that I, I, I did not see coming. I did not know that anyone actually wanted to talk to me or show up here. And the majority of the people that kind of came through when we first started this show, I was like, what? Oh, I don't know. That's, uh, yeah, huh? what? Why? Why do you want to talk to me? And then this guy, Eric, came in and he sent me a message and was like, hey, you know, I've had these experiences or this or that. Or, you know, he sent me this kind of intro message and I was like, huh, 
Interesting. So it's got a journey to truth. It's got an interesting story. I noticed he went to Antarctica. And at the time, you know, that that sort of message came through. I was I was I was genuinely interested because for me, one of one of the the sort of I wouldn't call it a disclosure. I would call it kind of like a running experience that I have had with things that I would call out of I'll just call it an out of body experience um, or a series of out of body experiences that I've been having intermittently since I would say about 2015, 16, um, you know, he, he, he was kind of describing in one of his interviews, something that felt similar to the dynamics or a situation that I had observed in some of my experiences with Antarctica, but he was a person who had actually lived there. He had actually been there. And so I will say, I, I, I was just very, very fascinated by his story. And so lo and behold, here we are, I think it's been a couple months since then, maybe it's been more, maybe it's been less. My concept of time is literally horrible. Um, and we ended up meeting at the Secret Space Conference, I, think, I believe it was just about 30 days ago, out there in Grafton, Illinois. A lot of you guys have heard me talk about it. My wife and Nora and I were doing, uh, we were doing sessions there and doing readings. And it was, it was a cool experience for me because it was the first conference I've been at in a while where all I really had to do was just hang out and do work and just kind of hang out with everyone. And, you know, granted, it was also really hectic because all we ended up doing was seeing people the whole time, which is a beautiful thing. It was a really awesome experience. But one of the people that we got to hang out with while we were there was Eric Hecker. And for those of you guys that have met people from your sort of internet soul group, and you've met them in your human life, there's always a little bit of a gap. There's always a little bit of a difference. You'll meet them and you're like, well, you're a lot bigger or smaller or weirder or just a totally different version of themselves when you encounter them in the physical body. One of the things I really like about Eric is that he he exudes a, a I'll, I'll just say it, a no bullshit form of authenticity that I really admire. I don't know if it's like the New York vibe. I don't know if it's just how he is. But one of the things I noticed when I met Eric Hecker in person was, I know you guys have had this experience when you've seen someone online and then you end up talking to them. And it's like, I could tell that there was like this con, there's this What's the word I'm looking for? There was a realness. There was an authenticity. You know, people that you can talk to and go, you know, I can actually have a conversation with this person. Okay. Because some people are just, you know, there's a there, there's a difference in how we connect socially. And so Eric was one of the people at the Secret Space Conference that my wife and I hung out with pretty much every day, just kind of chilling. Um, and honestly, I can say he's a he's very authentic and real and multifaceted, very multidimensional individual and honestly as soon as we were at that conference i was like okay we should definitely have this guy in here because i think he has an incredible story to tell i think he has some incredible experiences that help put the pieces together for those of us that are trying to understand what's going on in antarctica how does it relate with our experience how does it relate with things like secret space program how does it relate with things like you know the 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 hidden technology that is literally littering our world, um, and so we're going to bring Eric in to talk about a few of those things. I do want to let you guys know we're going to try to you know please do put questions in the chat. I say this every week, but we have an agreement this week. Eric and I made an agreement. We're going to be looking. <laughs> we're going to be looking for questions in the chat. So please let us know if you have any questions. But in the meantime. Um, we're going to be continuing to do this. We're moving this show to a format that's every other week. So every two weeks we're going to be doing this. Not that I don't want to do it every week, you guys, but just one of those things because I, I, I see people pretty much every day. For those of you guys that don't know, my primary occupation is as a professional psychic and what we might call an intuitive healer or any sort of woo-woo label you want to add to it, you know. Um, and so we, 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 you know, just due to the, due to the stuff that we have going on, we moved it to an every other week format. So every two weeks, we're going to be continuing to return to this strange space. Um, and anyway, yeah, I'll just keep talking on and on. We're going to, we're going to go ahead and bring Eric in. Um, but in the meantime, here we go. Prepare yourself. An awkward drum roll. Boom. Eric J. Hecker. Has <laughs> there it is. There it is. In the wilds of Alaska. Oh, thank you very much for such a fantastic intro. Um, Thanks, I really enjoyed <laughs> the energy of both you and your wife at the event. I found you two to be very kind souls and very authentic as well. And I just want to impress upon 
the general population out there, this is the benefit of these conferences. Oh my God, how joyful it is to be amongst peers. Really? Really? It's almost priceless. I totally agree. I totally agree. I was actually not expecting how awesome that conference was was like going to be. I knew it was going to be cool. I'll give a weird, here, here's a weird disclosure. I hadn't even been in public in months. <laughs> Dude, I don't go anywhere. So I'm like in a little, I'm like in, in this room here, you guys. I'm literally in this room every day. So for me, it was, it was, it was un- conditionally awesome but but anyway thank you i feel like it was i feel like it was like the woodstock of the ssp disclosure but like years from now people are going to be talking about man i was there man i was at that one in grafton yep that's where it all happened that's where it shifted i totally agree i totally agree i am honored that we were there and that we got to meet and be a part of that and for Mm -hmm. for those of you guys that don't know which i can see a couple of you guys in the chat you guys were definitely there but for everyone else that were there I was really blown away, Eric. I think on the last day, you had you you pulled out all of your memorabilia and maps and like it was like documents and stuff from your time in Antarctica. And so hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I kind of want to give you the floor in the beginning here and just uh, tell us who are you, what what's what what what's been going on in your world. I do have some questions for you, but just um, yeah, tell us about a little bit about your experience and bring us up to this now moment. Because I know you've had a lot of experiences both Antarctica. I know you were in the Navy for a while. I think you had some experiences in Montauk. I'll probably interrupt you constantly, but yeah, where did all this start for you? Where did this start? For you? you got it. Yeah, that's it's it's it is very complex. It's a lot to unpack, and you and you hit a lot of nails there. But you're right. My name is Eric J. Hecker, and I am trying to decipher my experience, having traveled many peculiar places on this planet and listened to other people about their experiences as I crossed paths with them, I started to learn that this world is a lot more complex than we've been presented. And I started to pay attention to the things that interested me that were, I guess, kind of on the fringe. But then I started to understand that my life was on the fringe. I didn't, I didn't really realize this. I just, you know, I was just a guy getting by doing things. Um, but then it started to dawn on me that, you know, the places that I've worked at, the people's paths that I've crossed, and officially the programs that I've been in were not all by happenstance. So I, I decided to start doing more research and due diligence to what I call reframe my memories, where I look back at things in my past and I call it like a snapshot, right? So in our memory banks, you have like a, like you can like almost walk down a hallway of your memory banks <clears throat> and it's like there's photographs on the wall. But when you look at the photograph, that's what your brain gives you as the comfortable memory. And it's in this matted framed thing on the wall. But what I call reframing your memories is removing the matting, removing the frame, and looking at that a whole image, not how your brain made it comfortable for you. That's a total so, experience, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people call it shadow work, I guess, where you have to go back and, and, and reconfigure your past and look at things differently. And it turned out I have a lot of shadows in my past. There was a lot of avenues that my psyche gave me very well framed and matted memories of. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to cut to the chase from the very, very start because I was front, I was front loaded. For those of you guys that haven't seen it, Eric has a really cool interview with Dr. Michael Sala out on his channel, um, which I also watched recently. And you, you had mentioned some, a, a really interesting thing in the beginning of that interview, which actually ties into experiences that I've had. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about it, but you had, you had talked very, very briefly, or actually it wasn't even briefly, you, you, you did talk a bit about it in his interview about how, when you were in, you know, earlier stages of schooling, we could say there were a number of what we might call testings or sort of program related occurrences or maybe even some substances that were given to you which is a it is a thing that I did not know about you but I had also had very very similar experiences um in between uh between first second and then I went into homeschool or I think I went to homeschool in fourth grade so between first and third grade in my life I was put through a round of weird testing and I was taken to all these 
weird offices at my school. And just like you were talking about in your interview, and they showed us pictures. I remember my sister was there. They wanted us mm -hmm. to read what the characters and the people and the animals felt like. They asked us all these very strange things. I know I, know I went back twice. And then very suddenly, my mom pulled us out of school. And we went to homeschool for the next two years. So there was a premonition of something that was about to occur in my life, but nobody knows what it was. I remember after a time, I think it was the second or the third time I went there, I would just go there and cry. And I think mm -hmm. really quickly they realized, well, this kid is not going to work. Get okay, get this guy out of here. But tell us about your experience that, because that was something that really sparked up some memories for me. But what was it like for you in the early days? What kind of stuff was going on? For the early days for me in, in my grammar school years, they would they would bring me to the, the library in my school. And I now know that this was a CIA DIA program known as Stargate, and it was a lot to do with remote viewing. And basically, they would bring us down there, they would separate us from the regular general population of students, and they absolutely 100, 1,000%, they were pumping our egos. You know, like you guys are the best of the best. You're so much smarter than the other kids. Like they were, this is the program. Like I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say right. that I believe these things, but this is what they were telling us. You know, like those other kids are dumb and you're better than them and you're special. And you know, this is why you get this treatment. You know, this is what they were doing to us. And it, and it works really well. I mean, it really did. I mean, we left, we would get pulled out of the class and we'd be running down the hallways, skipping and jumping towards the library. We couldn't get there fast enough. And when we got there, as soon as we would get in, um, first and foremost, the, the library was not arranged. It, I mean, the way that it was a standard library we would normally walk in. Now it was set up. They had all the blinds closed, almost like, like blackout shades. It was dark in there. And now they had like lighting at each of the tables instead of the other lighting that was above. So like, you know, Normally when you walk in, there's like the light switches on the wall and you can flip those on and the whole place is illuminated from, you know, the lighting up on the ceilings. Oh, that that was all off. Like reading in there, all the lights are right, on. Right, yeah, it's a library. It needs to be well illuminated. But now everything was dark. It was a library that was dark because we weren't there to read. And my recollections, and they are a jumble of things, so I do apologize. Mm -hmm. So this is like a quilt. This is like a quilt of, of memories, but they all apply to this library. Mm -hmm. When we would get in there, they would give us eye drops. So we, it was a Catholic school. So we had uniforms on and, you know, everything was very regimented and very old school. So they would make us tilt our head back and they would put a napkin by our eye as they administered the eye drops. And they would warn us to be very still to make sure that we didn't um, lose the uh, drops, get it on our uniforms. And we were informed that it would stain. So that would obviously be trouble. If you come home with a stained uniform, Obviously, that's not good. So they would tell us that routine, and it, you know, it turns out, at, at the very least, my dad didn't know that this was going on. Mm -hmm. I've conversed with my father since this, and he had no idea this was going on. He gave no authority for anybody to administer anything to me, and this is what they were doing. My understanding through research and talking to other folks that have been through similar processes is that this is probably a very, um, like a hybrid of LSD, that it was meant to be fast acting and short lived, I guess you would say, so that it would only do so much for so long. I've actually Wonder heard of a fast acting short term version of LSD. That, that that's a literally real thing. I don't know. I don't know the name of it. But anyway, in I drop form even. Yes, I've even yeah. researched it. Like this is. Yep, there was there was government programs for this stuff, and I recall when our session would end. I can get to the session later, but back to the LSD and, and its duration. When this session would end effectively, there'd be like a quick debrief at the end of the remote viewing session. And I remember having the wherewithal that I knew if I would if I rushed through the the debrief, I would get out with enough time to be in the front lobby of the school when they had ceiling to floor windows that were facing south and all the sun was coming in and a side effect of the eye drops was it was like I had yellow lens sunglasses on and yeah. I just thought it was really cool. I was a little kid and I was understanding this effect so I was hustling to get to the hallway so I'd have extra time to dawdle before I knew the next class that I had to be at. 
Yeah. And that was one of the things I always remembered. And I know they say in these programs that they can wipe our memories of things, but that our hearts, yeah. the certain feelings that we, we, they can't take from us. So this to me is one of those moments that I know that I held on to that they couldn't wipe because I had a, I had a feeling for that. I liked what I was accomplishing yeah. uh, in that environment that I could, I could have a positive gain. That it was like, oh, look, I get the yellow filter for a few minutes. Totally. So what do you think was the purpose behind what, what like they were giving you those like eye drops? Do you think it was so you could like connect more easily with what we might call psychic mm -hmm. or non-physical energies? Were you asked to kind of view wavelengths of light that maybe were coming in? Was it because I, I, I think I recall I, you mentioned a remote viewing in another interview. Tell, tell us a little bit about what the purpose behind that substance was. Or what do you think? My, this is. This is my belief and speculation of my experience because I'm working on confirming this. But I believe that they were using the LSD for the intention of getting us into the zone, so to say, that it removes certain barriers or, or things like that, and it just gets us on, on the right frequencies. Um, that children's minds aren't very biased to begin with, so it just promoted the intellect going in those directions and being, I guess, a bit more imaginative because imagination is a very powerful tool. Um, and in the remote viewing environment, imagination is not frowned upon. And a lot of people don't really know that imagination. I don't know what school of remote viewing you're into. Cause I've encountered some of them and they're like, there's no imagination in this. You're purely reading the coordinates. And then you encounter other people and they're like, it's mm. all about imagination. In my opinion, I would, and who does it, I guess we could say professionally, I think the imagination is the absolute most fertile zone for connecting with non-physical energies. But anyway, I sorry. couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> if, if we're going to talk about like the double slit experiment and what's really going on in the cosmos around us, you cannot negate the observer from the equation. Totally. totally. So this is, this is what was going on in these remote viewing schools with the children is that the children were very powerful tools. Um, in these dimensions. Yeah. So we were being utilized simply as remote viewing tools. It was, it was that simple, is that they would sit us down, they would go through the Robert Monroe Institute's protocols. Totally. And, and that's what was going on. So as a child, when they weren't explaining to me what they were doing, it just made no sense. Yeah. As an adult now looking back, I can just go, oh, now I know what they were doing. The protocols exist. Now I can get them explained. And now that reframes my memory of what was going on in the library. Back then, they just didn't tell me what they were doing. They would say, you know, we'd go, we would do an ideogram. And then they would tell me, you know, put your pen on the line. Do you see mountains or flat land? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why are they even asking? They don't tell me anything. They're not, you know, they're not explaining anything. So everything seemed like nonsense. Yeah. And they would say, and every answer that you give is correct, which right. makes no sense in the very regimented world that I was being raised in. Did you see the uh, the mountain or the flatlands? Did you see? What oh, all the time. I was, I, was, I was apparently very good at what they were trying to make me do because I was being brought back religiously. Yeah. I was very functional. They were constantly like thanking me and saying, good job but I didn't know what I was doing. You didn't know what? It's like, oh yeah. Okay. Answer, answer any question however you want, kid. And yeah. it's great. That's very right. much. Yeah, from my child perspective, it made no sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's Everything true. else in my education was prove your work. You have to prove this. You have to explain this. But in the library, it was bizarre world. We're going to ask you a question. You say whatever you think, and that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds like you got the positive or a, maybe a more positive version of that initial experience. I know things got really weird for you later on with some of the other stuff. I know for mm -hmm. me at that stage, mm -hmm. there was a definitive program of testing that I went through. I do remember them requesting there was like some sort of a call that my mom got at that time. And there was a lot of drama in my parents' life at that stage of our journey. So I think it was mm -hmm. almost pivotal over or it was all it was just, you know, whether me and my sister were going to go to it or not. But 
for me, that that stage was not a good experience. I wasn't, and, 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 you know, maybe this is kind of a quick question. Were you in the TAG or the GATE program or one of those special? Yeah, see, there you go. You're exactly. Yeah. Programs. Yeah, those, that's, the, that's, the pro, that, that's the program for sure that they were pulling us out for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I know for me it was not a good experience. I remember going to this 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 weird office in a high rise building in San Diego, California, um, and there was like this there was a woman up there that would show us these photos. Some of them were black and white. I remember she had us like moving some weird plastic objects. I don't know what I was meant to do with them, but it was like a stacking mm-hmm. thing, which is a very mm-hmm. bizarre behavior for kids that are you know. I don't know how I want to say I was like between six or eight or 10 years old, something like that. Mm. I was, you know, very too young, too old to be doing a stacking game and moving Mm. objects, but right. Too old. You know what I mean? It just didn't fit. I remember none of the tasking seemed appropriate. We, we got that a lot in the library as well is that everything was, everything was like, everything was BS. Like, like I knew it as a child, but it got me out of class. So in a way I didn't care. You know, yeah. it's like, all right, I'm in this room. It's bizarro world. Nothing's making sense, but it's a cool show in a way, you yeah. know? So like a lot of times what they would do with us is they would, um, they would tell us that we were in the library and they would say that there was a toy manufacturer oh, that was there. Yes. They totally. would say there's a toy manufacturer oh, and they're here to do testing on new toy products that are coming out. So they want to get your feedback and then they would proceed to put on the table in front of us stuff that looked like they picked up from a garage sale on the way in that morning. Uh There's nothing new about it. It was all antiquated crap, like in the eyes of a kid, right? Uh You know, it's like there's brand new GI Joe stuff and transformers that you want. Or there's like when you go to your grandma's house and they pull out stuff from the 1940s and they're like, here, keep yourself busy in the basement while the adults talk. And you're like, what is this thing? You know, is it made of lead? Should I be like playing with this? You know, but this is what they were doing. Like in the library, they were like, this false pretense was so disingenuous. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take you for what you're saying, adult that there's a toy manufacturer here that wants my feedback on what I think of these. Yeah. And it was total BS. Yeah. Oh man, I feel you. Here, get ready. Here comes a question from the chat. Ooh. Do you think it was the actual regular library? Was it a fourth density version of the library? Was the library a screen memory? Was it a different version of it? I know that's many questions in one. What do you think? Mm-hmm. That would be um, really hard for me to answer. Do I believe it was the actual library? I do. I do believe that I was entering that room and that whatever was going on in there was certainly peculiar activity, but I am an adherent to the idea that all possibility exists always. And I don't, I mean, there could be a, 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 a portal in that room, a story. I don't know. That place could have been, the, the devil could have incarnated in there at some point for all I know, all the shenanigans that were going on. It was an off the wall. Bad place for kids to be. And so this was on Long Island? Absolutely. Yeah. Near, as I understand, near the Montauk Project and supposedly near Camp Hero, right? Isn't that somewhere around there? It's 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 not a stone's throw away, but you know, Long Island is, you know, it's in the neighborhood of Montauk for sure. And I I, derp, I definitely have uh recollections of issues over in that area as well. I think that Long Island in general is what Eisenhower warned us about way back in the day. Beware the military industrial complex, because I would say that Long Island is almost geographically the definition of the military industrial complex. Yeah. Well, it I sounds mean, like you were you were basically living above like the Montauk project. If you were living there like in the eighties, right? I assume I think you were you're like a seventies kid, right? You were born in the seventies. Yep. Right. So I was what were, they called a latchkey kid back in the day. Oh dude, totally, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, people don't know these terms anymore. A latchkey kid. Yep. Like parents nowadays would have been arrested for latchkey right? kid <laughs> situations. 
Yeah, all right, yeah, dude, latchkey kid. That was that was a term from the early and late eighties, you guys, that now is completely and utterly normalized by our society. So somebody out there will know that term, but but so so anyway, so you were you were growing up on Long Island, going going through your thing, going through this, you know, kind of a weird program, you know, coming in and out of this, you know, library, doing a couple weird you know, whatever it was, testings or whatever was going on in your life. And when when did things kind of start to take a turn out of there? When did you notice that, you know, there was something very unique or strange about my experience? Because I know later on, I think you went into the Navy, as I understand, you did some other things. But tell us a little bit about the process, you know, after that. What ended up taking place? Officially, a lot of weird things occurred before I ever noticed, technically. So I... A lot of things occurred. There was a lot of water under the bridge before I looked back and went, what? You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think that my life was that peculiar, but I would tell stories to folks and people would look at me like I have 12 heads and tell me things like, you know, like I have like this Forrest Gump type life of experience or something that now that other people have kind of put my attention to that. I can't argue with them that it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. I guess, I guess it is weird to spend a year at the South pole station. I guess it is weird to, you know, work up that far North in the Arctic of Alaska. You know, it's it's, things started to add up where I started going, wow. You know, and, and I guess in conjunction with the programs that I was in as a child and then the submarine service, like maybe there is a lot more, guiding hand that I hadn't paid attention to through all the years. But now here I am and I can now look backward and realize that a lot of my path was more by design than choice. And as an example, I would say to folks like, you know, how many times in your life, Matthew, have you found yourself at a fork in the road, right? You have to make a decision. Right. It happens. Right. How many times do you show up in life and there's a fork in the road and you go, I can go left and I can go right. Right. That happens to everybody. But how many times do people show up to that fork in the road and ask themselves who built the road? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's that. That's a very good question. Very, very good. I'm just starting to understand that in my life, there were many times where I had a pseudo decision. But now looking back, I realized there was roads built. Yeah. Yeah. Here comes a weird follow up question. At what point did you get involved with the submarine service? Tell us a little bit about that process. In 1994, which I think is a banner year in the history of our cosmos. Why? What happened? Wow. Everything, everything on this planet. If you start to pay attention, everything went weird in 1994. It was a key year. It was, I think, I was, was in very... high school that year. Just so you know, not to date myself, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. But anyway, anyway. So yeah, mm-hmm. what, what that was happened? the year that Bill Clinton, as president, came out and apologized for all the uh, human experiments that the United States government had done prior. Really? Absolutely. That was on the list of things of weirdness. I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, as, as you pay more attention to the year 1994, you're going to notice a lot of things change. 94, 94. okay. Huh. Yeah, it was a pivotal year in reality. So that was the year that I showed up in the submarine service, and it was a very, I'll just say, peculiar experience for me. Yeah. And it was short-lived, but very uh, informative. Yeah. I had lost time at a moment. I had experiences with Raytheon and their technicians that I would say were very Montauk chair-like. Yeah. So Um, there was all kinds of shenanigans in a very short period of time in my submarine service. I'm going to ask an awkward question. Mm -hmm. Get ready. Here it comes. Just because here, let me just be totally real with you. It's just a thing that I do, but I, I observe people 
Maybe it's my occupation. Maybe it's my mission at this point. And I do a thing that I call, which is a horrible term. It's nothing like this, but I call it like a psychic polygraph or like an energy reading meter that everybody gives off. And one of the things I really loved about your Michael Sala interview is that right as you guys got into the stage where, where you were like, and it got kind of weird there. It was like on the, on the submarine timeline. It was like all kinds of where I was like, Oh, what happened there? So what, what happened in the submarine days? Why did you leave there? How did it get weird? Cause uh, to me, that's a fascinating thing when I will hear a person mm-hmm. mention a thing and the words do not describe the intensity of the energy that is within the in- individual. And so mm-hmm. having read that on the energy meter, I know that's an awkward intro to that question. Tell us about. No, this is, this is, this is great observation on your part because I am, <clears throat> I'm challenged on this topic. I have a lot of energy and interest in it, and I wish that I could say more rapidly, but it's literally one of the only topics in my experience that I have signed paperwork that um, prevents me from saying everything that I want to. Mm. So with that being said, I'm dancing. I can't yeah. deny it about yeah. a lot of things that I want to say on the topic, um, but it's challenging. So the, the lost time stuff. So a lot, a lot of it boils down to, it's like, if the Navy taught me stuff, then the Navy says, I can't talk about it. But if it's something in my experience, that's aside from their training, then I'm not muted on the topic. So the, the loss of time situation is something that I can address because that was very out of the ordinary. And it was, it was at a time period when I was already in the process of separating myself from my contract with the United States Navy. Yeah. And I was headed home to Long Island, uh, and I was at the New London train station, and I had a gentleman present himself to me as the executive officer mm. of one of the boats, one of the submarines. This gentleman, I'll just say kindly, was old, yeah, gray-haired and stuff like that. So you thought he I was know fake, enough. Of, right? What's that? So like you thought he was fake, or you did not believe? I knew he was fake. I knew a thousand percent that this gentleman was not the executive officer of a United States submarine because he's too old. So um, most like folks may just, not know that the crew on a submarine is very young, including the the officer line. It's a very fast advancing um, situation. So you'll see very young officers up to and including executive officers and captains. Mm -hmm. So when this guy said that he was XO of a submarine, I knew he was lying through his teeth. Right. But But but, but wait, so did he just roll up out of nowhere and was all, hey there, Eric? Or like, did he know you? Or was he like, hey, hey, how's it going? He didn't know me from a hole in the wall. He, I had my sea bag on my shoulder. I was a sailor heading home on Liberty. So he saw my sea bag and he made contact. Yeah. And he proceeded to try to engage me with things about my training and this and that. And it, it seemed odd and I was just letting them run with it. I was trained in certain amounts of things and we knew that our roles were important globally and that we may get questioned and, We had a certain amount of clearances and secrecy things that we were trained on, you know, to not disclose. But this guy was definitely going right for the jugular on a direction. So I was intrigued at the very least that this was happening to me. And then in the process, he was like, let me get you a beer and blah, blah, blah. Where are, you know, shipmates, you know, and I'm informing him, you know, I said, you know, you know, I'm I'm underage. It's against the law. You need to be informed, sir, you know, because I'm playing along. But long story short, he bought me a beer and we wound up BSing for a while. He continued to try to grill me on things that were um, beyond what he should be asking about. And then at a point in time, I informed him that I needed to get back to the train station to catch my train. We were not that far away from the train station, maybe a five minute ride. We had been walking most of the time. I had deliberately looked at my watch entering the cab. And when I arrived at the train station, what should have been five minutes later, it was actually, I had lost 20 minutes time in that cab ride with that guy. 
what happened in the 20 minutes do you think Did, was there an experience did you go through a portal was it one of those like something I in the year and you're like boom and you pass out and then it's like oh he's back bring him back and they bring you back on the timeline 20 minutes later like what what do you think i have i have a complete clean disconnect at that point yeah i i lost 20 minutes cleanly and crisply and you there was no blend there was no confusion fusion it was like something happened there and all i knew was i knew it happened yeah that was all i could pull from it was i just knew that much whatever they did they did well yeah and so was that was that before you ended up well obviously it was before you left the sub service right it was do you feel like before i had it was before i had been separated it was also um around the time period that I was offered assistance uh, to separate by a technician from Raytheon who the idea was kind of a quid pro quo type situation that he had a project that he was working on Yeah, huh. in the basement of a top secret building. Was that the chair that you mentioned briefly? Absolutely. That's correct. Oh, okay. so I, tell, I went, us- yep. I went to go, I went to go meet this person who was offering their assistance and I, my memories fade at the point at which there was a curtain drawn back and an illuminated chair that I was to get in. Can you describe it? Just anything that you can... Uh, I can, you know, yeah. It would be like, so like when you go to a hospital and they have the chrome um, piping around the ceiling mm-hmm. that they can pull the curtain around, like a, like a medical curtain, like as if you're in the emergency room. And I believe it was green was my recollection. So the curtain was pulled back around. The light was down from the middle. So when I first showed up, it was dark because the light was in the area that the curtain was wrapped around. And then when the cart, the curtain was drawn, then I could see that the chair was there, like, you know, kind of on a tilt and highly illuminated. And that I was to sit in the chair and help him out with his project. What happened when he sat in the chair? I don't, I don't have any recollection actually beyond um, arriving to the room, the curtain being drawn, and seeing the chair. Huh. Whoa. That's, that, that, that's a trip. I'm assuming, and I, I, I say this in a very loose kind of open way, I'm assuming that that's a version of some of the technology that was used in things like Montauk and in other forms. And oddly enough, one of the other synchronicities with your and my experience is that through one of the just experiences that I've had over the past few years, I have actually had the, I call it a privilege to view a piece of technology like that. Um, A chair in a room surrounded by a circular sort of element of tubing and a cylinder that came down from the ceiling, like a metal cylinder that looked like a drum and a chair that was sitting there and a floor that was made out of glass and a whole team of individuals that were brought in to view it. And I, it sounds crazy not to go on a tangent here, but I, I was viewing this through my the experience that I had. I was viewing it through the eyes of, I believe, a middle-aged woman with very brown hair that had a little bit of a larger body. Because I remember mm. when I sat in the chair, I was viewing it through someone else, and I could see her hands, and she was moving her hands away, her, her hair away from her face. And what they did is they put a visor on you in the chair. And I remember when she or me, it was like myself, but I knew that I was viewing it through someone else's eyes and you would sit down in the chair and they put a visor on you and it would go and it would like seal onto your face. And anyway, there's a bunch of other stuff that happened after that, that I won't get into, but yeah, what, what, what happened when you uh, went in that room with the chair? Dad, I wish I knew Matthew. I can, I can only presume that it was um, like a, like a, like a Montauk chair, a trip chair. And, at that point, it's a multifaceted device. And I think in a way it was these programs getting me to volunteer myself to go back in, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and that what can be done with those chairs is, you know, there's a lot of things that could be done with those chairs. It could be enhanced remote viewing. It could be time travel. It could be popping into other, uh, suits, so to say, like, um, how do I put the term? Your consciousness can be like sleeved into other places. Mm-hmm. So things like that. 
you know, there's all kinds of things that could be done. And I have recollections in my past of doing things like that as well through the Montauk experiences. So I, I feel like in a way what wound up happening with my submarine service was it was a way for them to strong arm me back into the programs that I had gotten out of previously. Yeah, I'm going to put this on the screen. Maybe, oops, sorry, wrong one. But yes, thank you, Susan Long. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what do, what do you think? I mean, you've kind of already answered this, but like formally, do you think they uh, downloaded anything out of you? Did they put anything in? Did they put you on another timeline? I think the submarine service stuff was actually trained into me um, through my whole life. I think that the rate that they had got me to contract for is not something that the United States Navy waits for an 18 year old to show up and be like, yeah, I would like to do that for you. And then they start training you on that role that you're supposed to be proficient in now in a few months. Yeah. I think the training and the selection process starts way earlier and that our society doesn't understand the factions that exist and the processes being applied to our children for departments that know the products that they're looking for and they're harvesting them or seeding them or fertilizing them, choose your word at an age that we're not privy to. Totally. It makes sense. It makes sense to me, especially if you were living in the region of the country where one of the most infamous top secret time bending, you know, projects was going on it stands to reason that you would incarnate in a place like that and you would have a series of pivotal experiences even if you weren't necessarily related to montauk itself you went mm -hmm. through a number of experiences we could even say who knows maybe you popped in from another timeline and you were brought mm -hmm. back into that wave of experience mm -hmm. in which you know maybe it was different for you in this life maybe you didn't have to go into that you had a different kind of you know experience of mm -hmm. it but anyway i don't know oh, if that's no. Sense, but yeah, no, that, 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 that strikes a chord because on a whole other level, I've, I've worked with folks like similar to yourself. I, I don't know the right, everybody uses different terms. I use the term energy healers. People have their own specialties, right? Yeah. You do things, right? Um, but I've worked with other folks and they have said, you know, like everyone else, we've, ch we've chosen to be here, right? Yeah. That we have a mission that we've selected. And what I keep getting from folks is they're telling me is that I have a very, um, strong mission to be on and I that I, I like vehemently chose it, that, that this was a mission that was going to happen. It was a very important mission to occur. And somehow I like came in, kicked the door in and was like, hold on a second. I have the right to this. Yeah. And I utilized my right that some, whatever that means, you know, that I was, I'm some person. Yeah. that had this past that allowed for me to command this right, that this mission was that important and I cared so much about it that I literally kicked in the door and it was like, I don't trust any of you to do this. I'm on it. Yeah. We could say that's the mark of a highly advanced being incarnated within a human vessel which for some individuals would be like, what? So you mean you think you're better? Guess what? There's a lot of highly advanced beings incarnated on earth right now. It's a, it's a thing. But to me, that is the mark of an highly advanced being. It's like, even though we don't know the exact reason why you come here, you know, the, you know, you know, the energy through which you bring in and you're not going to take anything other than what that is that you agreed to. And so I can, without pause, look around this whole entire situation and explain to people what's not right about it. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people would take that as me being negative. And I would say that's just me being honest and doing the job mm -hmm. that I was sent to do was ascertain. Are all of you people being treated correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. I would say that they're not mm -hmm. and something should be done about it. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. So Anyway, here, here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep the ball rolling. So why did you leave the sub service? What happened and where did you go after that? Cause I know that was a pivotal mm. moment in Eric's journey here on this. Kind of like one of those that you talk about where you're like, which way do yep. you now? I, I will say that I was not finding, I wasn't finding the presentation to be delivered from what I was told about the United States Navy and the submarine service, mm. that I was presented something 
and I was questioning the veracity of what I was being presented at the time. Mm. And that line of questioning and my position on things made things difficult to the point that I had decided that it would be better off to attempt to separate than continue in that process. I mean, I wasn't a knucklehead. I did really well in the Navy and the submarine service proper. Mm -hmm. Um, So with that being said, I had 50% of my chain of command that was livid with me for trying to separate. Hmm. I had the other 50% that was supporting me because they understood me and what was going on. Yeah. So it was at the time for me, a battle for my future. Yeah. How will this become? I was, I was threatened with military prison for a very long period of time for the choices that I was making in that time period of my youth. Mm. But I chose to go against um, great obstacles for what I knew at the time was actually my freedom. Yeah. Oh, very, very interesting. So, so you ended up exiting service, you know, you got out, you know, you, you, mm-hmm. you transitioned out of there and um yeah, what what happened? Or, or actually, rather, tell us about the road to Antarctica. And I'm assuming there was, a big, there was a big gap in between those two. And, I know and the, and the, the big did. gap is easy to cover. The yeah, big gap ahead. from the Navy to Antarctica was effectively my plumbing career on Long Island. There we go. There we go. So that, that, that basically is it. I wound up getting a plumbing career on Long Island, working on the North Shore of Long Island, which is called the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. People have no idea where the wealth is in this nation. And it's on the Gold Coast of Long Island. It always has been. It never left. And the clientele that I was working for, again, were the military industrial complex that we were warned about. This Mm -hmm. is where they lived. So you, is, you know, Long Island proper. So I was I was working in their residences and their corporations for for the companies and owners of the corporations that we now are getting disclosed as the privateers in the secret space program. So you have companies like AIL, TRW, Paul Corporation. These are these are the outfits. Yeah. For some freak coincidence, I went into being the approved plumber for these facilities. Interesting. Interesting. You know, like when your sink leaks, you go to the yellow pages and you call a plumber because it don't matter, right? Whoever comes, comes, get it fixed, right? Not a big deal. But when you have, you know, these billionaires and their homes and their, their military industrial complex agendas, they don't just simply let anybody in. Right. The world's way too complex for that. So the fact that I was on that list means a lot. So you were an approved service provider for the Long Island elitist crew, having served in the subservice, having been, uh, you know, a bunch of other weird testing. MK Ultra, programmable, able to be zapped and wiped and all of these things. It, it made me a tool. Yeah. Let me ask you a weird question. Why plumbing? Because I was a plumber as well. For those of you guys watching, you won't know this, but Eric and I know this. I spent several years working as a plumber as well. Why Why did you end up doing uh, the plumbing scene? <laughs> I'll give you my plumbing answer. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> I became a plumber because of a lack of proper decisions up until the day I became a plumber. <laughs> There you go. The, right? Is it, wait, is that why everyone uh, becomes a That's plumber? pretty much everybody gets into the trades. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Should have made better choices. Now you're a tradesman. Dude, same here. I was like, oh, you get paid uh, like this much? Really? Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll do mm-hmm. that. Six years later, I'm like, I hate this. Why did I ever start doing this? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah, laboring is very laboring. Yeah, totally. The plumbing scene... A lot of you guys do not know this about myself, but yes, I was a plumber for many years. It was definitely a thing, but uh, I did not get to go to Antarctica. So anyway, you were out there doing this scene on like Long Island, you know, Mm -hmm. 
clogging everybody's drains and redoing their bathrooms and putting, you know, garbage disposals in and, you know, like whatever mm -hmm. it is. And, and so how, how, how did you go from, you know, the Long Island plumber to the elite to suddenly I'm going to Antarctica and now I'm here for a year. Like, tell us a little bit about the timeline there. You got it. Basically, it was when the Obama administration showed up and decimated the American economy. A lot of people forget when that happened, but that actually occurred. Um, things were going fine and dandy, and then President Obama became president, yep. and then the economy in the U.S. went, <gasps> it tanked. We were talking and like I was a, 2008, right? Around yeah, yep. So I was a plumber, and I was not, I mean, I was an effective plumber. I'm not an effective businessman. So when my business was tanking because the economy was ripped right out from under me, I didn't have the business savvy to do anything else. So I started looking in other directions. And in that process of me being, you know, ready, willing, and able to take on any task, I came across this contract at the South Pole Station. And I went for it and got it. Yeah. And it was the weirdest thing to me and everybody that I knew at the time. But lo and behold... I was headed south to South Pole Station, and in November of 2010, I set foot in Antarctica, and it was one of the most wildest experiences that I could even begin to attempt to try to discuss to people, and I'm doing the best you know, with my website and stuff like that to try to communicate this to folks, but I'm learning it's really challenging because it's, it's so outside people's experience banks in a way. So I think lots of times what I'm trying to learn is that there's a lot of my experiences that because I have had all of these things occur in my life, it makes sense to me. Totally. And when I try to communicate it to other people, I'm learning it's going over everybody's heads just because they don't have anywhere near a similar life experience. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to communicate things to people in a way that it's received. And I, I feel that the burden of that responsibility is on me um, to do that is the way that I was reared. But it's, you know, so now I just feel like I'm going through the motions of, you know, having all these conversations with folks like, hey, you know, Antarctica is crazier and worse than anybody's ever told you so far. And I apologize that I'm going to throw you so far down the rabbit hole right now. Yeah. But that's the reality of things is that I don't even know where to begin with we have such a huge disconnect in vernacular nowadays. Like there's, there's no vocabulary for the problems that are actually being presented to humanity because the powers that be have done due diligence to make sure you don't know what those problems are like literally. True. So we don't have the words to discuss the issue. Yeah. And that's where I'm trying to come from straight, straight out of South Pole with things like directed energy weapons and mind control and global manipulation. And these are kind of new and scary terms to people as far as being real. You know, everybody like you could talk about it in a movie or a television show. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's cool because it's sci fi. But what happens when it's straight up happening right now? now yeah and you know people say well if, if somebody knew about this stuff you know if someone knew something they would say something yeah, yeah. yep Ten four. and i'm and i'm that guy i know something and i'm saying something yeah. and there are directed energy weapon systems at the south pole station in antarctica and it's documented i've provided the information it's available in the archives at deciphering.tv so it's not it's not up to question these are cold hard facts that society has to start learning to consider in their reality what do yeah. we do when we realize these technologies that we've seen in movies have actually been functioning for decades oh, yeah. what cool. do we do when we hear corporations like mcdonald's say that they're looking into the research and development for technologies that will allow them to pump commercials into you when you're sleeping yeah, I heard about that one. I saw that, yeah. Right, so if McDonald's is doing that right now, how long has the technology existed in other people's hands? Oh, well, totally, if, especially if it's been consumerized. You know, it's gone through decades of like, okay, we're done with that old toy. Uh, give, it, right. give it to those guys. We don't need it anymore. Right. We got direct entrainment. Give so how long has the CIA yeah. and the DIA been pumping ideas into people's heads while they're sleeping? Huh. It's a very good question.
I'm going to follow it up with an almost non sequitorial question <laughs> just because I want to know this one. Sorry. we're mm -hmm. Now we're going Go into for the Antarctica chapter of, of your experience. And here, here, here's the deal, Eric. You're one of only two people that I know that I've met in this human life that has been to Antarctica. I think you and Brad Olson are the only people. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really talked to Brad Olson. I just heard his interview. But anyway, um, here comes a kind of a dumb question. What was the first thing you noticed when you either flew in there or you went on a boat or however you came into Antarctica? Because it is one of the places that most of the people in our lifetime on this planet are never going to see. Let's just face it. Okay, let's just be real. Most of us are never, ever going to see this massive continent underneath the bottom of our planet that's nearly bigger than most of the other continents on the planet. What was it like when you first set foot out there? What was the journey like? How did it go? So I would say when I felt like it was Antarctica proper was when I was flying from McMurdo Station, which is on the coast. Mm -hmm. When I was headed further south to South Pole Station, I did have the benefit of being in the cockpit of the C-130 Hercules, which was also an amazing coincidence. So I had an, an awesome view of most of the flight going over the Trans-Antarctic Mountains and the such. And my first thoughts, really, that, that was when it hit me hard, the, the depth of the experience that I was about to undertake, because you realize there's, there's nothing, there's nothing there. You're in, the, you're in Antarctica, it's the fifth largest continent, and as we're flying over the glaciers and the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, it dawns on you that if this plane goes down, there's no, there's no one coming. There's no one coming to help us in time. There's, there's no you're help. so far from resources. So your first thought in Antarctica is, God damn, I need to be on my game. This yeah. is as real as real gets. Yeah. Mother Nature is going to try to kill you every second of every day, and your whole mission is to get out of here alive because this is as harsh as an environment as this planet has yeah. good luck that was the understanding that you almost had to have with antarctica immediately antarctica is going to try to kill you and humanity is going to attempt to support you yeah damn that's what was going on i was dealing with humans that were going to attempt to support me in antarctica but i was staring at antarctica damn how long? And she she has already decided that she doesn't want things living there. Yeah. Damn. How long was the flight from, say, like Long Island to Antarctica? What was that journey like? I went from Long Island to uh, Centennial, Colorado, and I had a pause there for some training for a few days to a week, if I remember correctly. Then we went from Centennial, Colorado to LAX, Los Angeles. Then from LAX, we went to Auckland, New Zealand. Mm. And then from Auckland, that was a 13 hour flight. Yeah. Then from Auckland, New Zealand, we had to do a, a quick jump over to Christchurch, New Zealand. Mm. I got stuck in Christchurch, New Zealand for about a week, which was a very beautiful city wow. prior to being destroyed by earthquakes about a year later. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Interesting. It was a very beautiful city. But then from Christchurch, I then went to McMurdo, which was about a five and a half hour flight, if I remember correctly. And then in McMurdo, which is the largest installation on the continent proper, I would say that I was probably there less than 12 hours before I got on another flight to go all the way down south to South Pole. Yeah. And, and then I spent a year straight down there. Um, I refused. They do offer a break in between the summer and winter season. It's offered. Um, most people do take it. I was apparently uh, an abnormality because see, the huh? vacation, it gets you off the ice, but they put you back in New Zealand, but you have to pay for everything. They're not paying for you to be off. So you lose the money and you have to pay for your time. So I basically told them, no, thanks. I'll just stay here. I probably would have like, you actually. Probably would have stayed. But, yeah, I just stayed. So I did. I did 366 days straight on on the ice in Antarctica. So what was your job there? What exactly were you doing? Take us through a little bit of Eric's life in Antarctica. What kind of plumbing were you doing? What stuff were you working on? 
we know you were working with the neutrino, the like the ice cube thing, but tell us more about that. I have some weird questions about that as well. But yeah, anyway. yeah, you got it, you got it. So basically, a regular day, we would we would wake up. I was contracted as a plumber officially. That's my trade. That's my proficiency, my expertise. Plumbing and heating, I'm really darn good at that. But at the South Pole Station, we all work kind of as a team in what they call like the utilities department, as UTs would be the term. So in a way, we would all take care of the facility doing basic um, preventative maintenance tasks. You know, here we give you a list and go look at this and check this item, check the belts on this, check the tension, check the gauge on this. So there's a lot of checking of things to make sure everything's all right. And then heaven forbid you find something that's in error, Mm -hmm. you would then kind of default to whoever the trade expert is, right? So if I'm doing PMs and all of a sudden, hey, I got a problem and this thing's got low voltage, well, then we're gonna default to the electrician and the electrician's gonna write up a work order and say, this is what needs to be done. I'm gonna need help with this, this, and this. And I might wind up being a helper for the electrician one day right? because there's an electrical issue. But on another day, we might find that there's an equipment failure that's plumbing related. So now all of a sudden, I'm the plumber. So I'm going to be the lead guy, and I'm going to write up the job, and I'm going to say, this is what needs to be done today. I'm going to need a crew complement of this, and and I just become the lead, and other people become my apprentices at that point. And that was kind of more or less how the average day went. And it was like we would say that the South Pole Station was a lot of boredom broken up by moments of sheer terror Ooh. is basically how it went down. So in the middle of these mundane, benign moments of like, you know, checking the checkbox, you know, all right, you know, equipment number, you know, makeup air unit number four, the filters are changed, the belts have the right tension, everything's going great. Then all of a sudden, alarms go off. You're doing boring, benign stuff, but now all of a sudden, eh, 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 there is a fire. Is it like a whole the, station alarm? Is it like oh, one of those absolutely, things? yeah, full blown station wide. So now all of a sudden, in the middle of boredom, the fire alarms go off, and I was the attack team lead for what we called Team Two, which was the fire brigade. So full on bunker gear at this point, we would have to suit up and move towards the problem. Yeah, and this was also a part of life. So the average day, the average tasking, yeah, the plumbing stuff, yeah, pretty boring. Not that, not that big of a deal. Sometimes, yeah, we'd have catastrophic failure of equipment and I'd be tasked really hard of my skills to be a plumber. But the real challenging stuff was when the alarms went off. Yeah, and well, that's when it was that, like... Like what, what, what sort of things failed? How weird or bad did it, did it actually get? One of the scariest moments of my entire life was during the winter season at South Pole Station. We had done all kinds of emergency responses before my team was tight. We had everything covered. We were dialed in. But on one particular day when the alarms went off, myself and um, my co-lead, Christy, um, amazing, amazing partner on the fire brigade. So we had an alarm for an outbuilding, which was cryo. So. Mm. Okay. We had a cryogenic facility with about a half a million gallons of helium stored at freakishly low temperatures. They were stored at, uh, let's see, over on that end, I believe they were at, I think it was four degrees Kelvin, which is four degrees above absolute zero. Yeah. So this was some pretty intense materials, technically a super fluid which is another whole conversation. But either way, we have this material stored. And according to our training, if there's a leak of this system, it could be problematic because it expands at about 450 to one. Hmm. So this could have been a big bomb type situation if this fire had engaged this system. And we were getting an alarm for this building and Christy and I went to our lockers to gear up as usual. Things, things happen. We've had all kinds of crazy alarms, but we were team two. So we start gearing up as our first responders go to the site and assess reality to give a report right. as they then evac the situation for us to respond. Mm-hmm. But effectively, as her and I were now facing each other, because this is an outbuilding, so what we would do, the protocol was we start dressing each other. 
right. it's because it's just faster. So I'm putting her stuff on mm-hmm. her and she's putting my stuff on me and positioning everything appropriately. In this process, her and I are talking, going through the normal motions. Hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. I heard the alarm. Okay, we're going to need an extinguisher. We're going to need demo tools. You know, we're just going through the motions. All of a sudden, our, our LMR radios light up from the first responders. So the first <laughs> team? Freaks me out. The, the first responders show up to where the alarm is. Right. And they start calling in. They're freaking out. Yeah. That is, it's completely engulfed. It's on fire. This is not. A false okay. alarm. Okay. This was bad. This was so bad that this building was burning. And at that point, Chris and I just, we stopped talking. It was just like, oh, we heard the call out that, blah, 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 blah. And it was just like, all right, 10 4. Like we heard it. We understood it. We knew what to do. But boy, there was no reason to even talk anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, what? Huh. So I remember exiting the building with her and we had extinguishers over our shoulders and Halligan tools. And I remember walking out over the ice. Uh, you know, it was, it was extremely cold at the time. So we had to walk. Um, we had to be very careful not to break our equipment. It wasn't designed for those temperatures. Oh, so okay. we, yeah, it was over. It was, it was in excess of minus 90 degrees, I believe at the time ambient. So SCBA equipment is not meant to be functioning in that. Oh. So we had to, we had all finagling that we did, but we were crossing the ice in silence. I can, I could hear the crunching of the ice. I can picture the backlit building with the moon behind it in the darkness, knowing, and I could see the smoke coming out. And I remember just thinking to myself, we're not even going to make it to the building. That thing's going to fucking ignite. Did it? And that, that wall is going to come at me at Mach 12 was what I was thinking. Huh. I just kept thinking, we're not, we're, we're, we're walking towards a problem we're never going to make it to, is what I was thinking. Yeah. And that's why we weren't talking anymore because it was just like, we're just... Suicide mission. Here we go. It's totally, yeah, it's just totally, I was waiting to see, I was waiting to see a flash. I was waiting to see that building become round for a millisecond before a wall just hit me in the face. Yeah. Wow. And we just kept walking towards it, and it never happened. I was terrified out of my mind that it was going to, but it never happened. And we got to the building. We breached the door. We put the fire out, and it worked. Whoa. But I was scared (laughs) shitless every step of the way. So what was it, 500,000 gallons of helium is sitting in tanks right next, or however, just, you know, a lot of helium, which is going to, mm-hmm. for those that don't know, incredibly explosive, can, you know, blow up, you know, probably like a lot of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, not kinetic energy, what's that, Potent- a lot of potential energy was involved yeah. to extreme levels. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just waiting for that thing to pop. Totally. Thank you, Leyland. The last place in the world where you'd want anything to go unexpectedly wrong, Antarctica. Exactly. And yeah, so, so you guys were able to kind of put out the fire. You were able to kind of get, you know, that stuff straightened out, mm-hmm. um, which which is a good thing. Imagine if, you know, probably happened, maybe the whole station would have blown. I mean, do you, do you think it was large? I enough? believe the, the blast radius of that building would have actually negatively impacted the elevated station and potentially our emergency escape program entirely i think that would have been a devastating event there was a fistful of there was a fistful of situations that happened that i think could have taken us out that was that was the worst one i believe that one would have that would have been uh, making history on the planet somebody out there would have said i swear to god it was an underground base you know and of course you know, the like the, the place would have actually blown, but watch like the cover story would have been like it was a dumb, it was a dumb. You know what I mean? You could just see how that one would get like twisted. But anyway, mm-hmm. aside from that, here comes here comes another question, which is a thing that I think a lot of people, or, or maybe I, maybe not a lot of people, but I would like to know. Tell us about the ice cube neutrino. Is it, was it a generator or like a monitor detector. station? Yeah, go ahead. Tell us about that. Detector. Yeah, this this is this is this is actually the most important stuff. And I yeah. really, I really want people to pay really close attention to this. Okay. There's a device that is to the cost of 
hundreds of billions of dollars down there mm-hmm. called the Ice Cube mm-hmm. Neutrino Detector. So think of this like radar in a way, right? Detection. Actually, hold on. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm going to ask the dumbest question of all because I know there's a couple other people out there who don't know this as well. But uh, I'll just say, it. Eric, I don't know what a neutrino is. We <laughs> could you, you got it? Yeah, yeah. In, in very simple terminology, mm-hmm. what is a neutrino? Why would we want a be- neutrino? Is a near or massless particle, and I'm going off the definitions that I was given at the time that I was there. It's a near or massless particle that moves close to, at, or beyond the speed of light, and that's the purpose of the detector is to answer those questions. Okay. Okay. That's kind of it in a nutshell. So the idea of this detector was to detect these neutrinos to get more of a tight answer to that question. Right. So in this process, they built this massive, expensive detector. And the idea is that it's passively receiving information from around us to answer those questions. That a neutrino, when it moves through the ice in Antarctica, so the ice cube neutrino detector is basically covering a large area. It's a, a giant hexagram shaped item um, that has a uh, length, width, and height of close to two miles high and about a mile by a mile in the other dimensions. So this thing's massive. And so, but this goes like, it, like into the ground, as I understand, it's like into a, the ice. Like, into ice. So at, the, at Antarctica, um, at the South Pole Station, our facility was at 10,300 feet of elevation actual. Okay. That's of ice. That's 10,300 feet of ice above the ground. Wow. The ground is way down at sea level. So in that stack of ice, they melted out columns and dropped down cables. And on these cables, They have these round things about the size of a basketball that they call a DOM, a digital optical module. Mm -hmm. And these DOMs are receivers. So there's 5,160 of them embedded in the ice in this array. So anytime a neutrino passes through the ice and makes contact with the nucleus of an ice molecule, there's an effect where a blue light flashes which is called Cherenkov light, I believe. And then the end result, so when you previously had a neutrino hit the nucleus, those two things disappear, and you now have what is called a muon. Hmm. So this is, this is physics at the front end, and they're trying to define whether the physics that we know is legit or something else. This is where they're learning at. This is the, this is the front end battle lines of science on what we know. So this detector, as presented, is doing that task, huh. detecting so, and observing and tracking yeah. neutrinos. Sorry, here comes one of those questions I'm going to insert in the middle of what you were saying. A few moments ago, you said that it generates kind of like a blue flash or something, right? Like a, like a, like a blue light. This might be yep. an even dumber question, Eric, but do you think it is possible for human eyes or human consciousness to perceive those lights that come from neutrinos? Because I don't know, maybe I'm a weirdo, but I see blue orbs in the world like literally every day, like little sparks of blue light all around me. It's one of, it's like, I, I should talk about it more, but I wonder if that could be an extension. Of that's that literal that's an amazing light. question. And I believe, it's, it's so funny, I, 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 my belief is that that blue light is visible light. Huh. It's just that we don't have the opportunity to keep our faces down in the ice for right. all of that period of time. So this is just a circumstance where the um, appurtenance, the, the, the neutrino detector is an extension of us. So just like every other thing, it's just, you know, it's, it's a measuring device. The neutrino detector is a measuring device of yeah. apparently what I believe is visible light down in the ice. It's just that how do you observe that? And this is the array that they decided makes that happen. So since you can't be down in the ice, what do you do to observe the blue light flashes? We make these DOMs yeah. and you embed them in the ice and you have their comms cables go back to a central processing system. 
But now the terror of this all yeah. is that that's what this device is being presented as. Mm -hmm. What I've provided documentation for is that each of these DOMs is not just a receiver. It also has the ability to transmit at up to 2,047 volts per DOM. So times that by 5,160, and we're looking at a massive a lot of volts. phased array transmitter, which brings us right into the ballpark of, well, what could a phased array transmitter do? Well, mm -hmm. folks, right. a lot of horrible things. Like what? And that's what I'm trying to like mind control, like weather manipulation, um, like intergalactic communications, which isn't necessarily nefarious, but if they're lying about the activity, then that's no good. Yeah. So makes sense. a lot of stuff with the secret space program, this is a direct link right now because this is the comms device. A lot of people are talking about the secret space program and how these things practically function. And I think a lot of my experiences are coming from departments, which are support staff, to the reality of the secret space program. So if you're going to take a ship, and you're going to shoot it out to the cosmos, and you're going to go, hey, go 80 light years in that direction. Okay, cool. No problem. When you get there, let us know that everything's working out well. Well, how am I going to do that without comms? Oh, good question. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So this is, this is the comms device that allows for instantaneous communications at great distance. We have to have that somewhere on our planet at least one spot for at least one faction, let alone the many others. Yeah. I'm just, I just found one. I've been to one. I actually believe there's more because I don't think every faction's agreeable. Right. So you are next to one of the very large versions. But then again, wait, you also live in Alaska. So technically you're near another huge one. Well, wow, that's a weird synchronicity. Not only was he in Antarctica for the ice cube, but you're also not too far away from Harp, I guess. Which is it? Is that even going on still, or is it just? Is Absolutely, a hundred percent. I visit there myself regularly. Oh, really? The Harp facility? Yes. Huh. I am close enough. It is on my radar, and they are a thousand percent functional every single day there's all kinds of propaganda that makes the press about the potential of them shutting down or losing funding and maybe they're not going to be open and it never comes to fruition yeah they're always funded they're always functioning and they're up and running right now yeah they're just under covers now there's yeah mm -hmm. makes sense it makes sense here comes a weird angular question or maybe it's an observation um, having heard you talk a bit about a, a little bit about the ice cube neutrino detector and other interviews, one of the things that came to me when I sort of saw I, I don't remember who it was with, but you had shown some some images of kind of like a it was an illustration of the neutrino detector and it showed those sort of poles or the cables going into the ground and um, mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible? I mean, maybe this is just a brainless question, but do you think it's possible that the that they're also monitoring the energy flow and the ongoing, maybe we could even say comms and just activity underneath the ice as well? Because when I see that, that to me, that's where it that's where it uh, went, because I also believe and this is going to get to a thing we're going to talk about in a minute, because I've remote viewed very vividly and had very vivid experiences of viewing other forms of technology, which I I should say, I, I, not that I know, I believe very strongly that it was in Antarctica. But do you think that this device is being used to kind of monitor the goings on of all the stuff underneath the ice? Under and above. Absolutely. I, I am an adherent to all possibility exists always. Uh, there's certainly only a limited amount of things that I can prove. But I do believe that there's some sort of inner earth access at pole. Uh, I believe that there is also a convenience path for people to get on and off of our planet is at the Southern Pole. So I believe that the South Pole Station is also like an observatory just for transit, to watch what's mm -hmm. transiting and those things that are coming from off world, onto world and or into world, that this is a point to observe. Yeah. Huh. Here comes a here comes another weird statement. Would it be safe to say, or somewhat close, to say that the new that one of the additional functions of the ice cube neutrino detector is sort of like a interplanetary 
air traffic control system in that it's sort of monitoring or viewing or tracking the you know comms that are occurring with you know ships outside of the earth maybe also within the earth if we're looking at the inner earth as a completely separate yet contiguous you know world within itself which in my opinion it literally is there's a whole other mm -hmm. density when we go inside the earth which isn't really inside the earth feels like you're outside the earth but it's a realm contained within mm -hmm. the sphere um, do you does that does that statement make sense? Could it be like it an air traffic controlling thing? I, I I believe that a thousand percent actually is that it's absolutely it's such an observation point on so many ways, yeah. So many frequencies that this this device is so multifaceted that it's beyond people's current levels of comprehension. We've been so dumbed down to what potentially is going on around us that what's going on around us, most people aren't really, they're not re even really ready for the conversation. They've been so dumbed down. Yeah. Huh. Well, I, maybe you kind of hinted at this in another interview, but it sounds like uh, this, this uh, device or this like array that's down there could also be used to create, maybe we could call influencing or mind control. Or maybe we could even call it as a, you know, as a, you know, directed energy weapon, which in my opinion, yeah. just for the record, I believe it totally is 100%. But tell, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that. What do you think about the other functions? I, I, I think in the grand scheme of these technologies and what I've studied from Nikola Tesla and how people like to use his technology and misuse his technology, I think that we need to be very concerned at the powers that be that have these technologies at their disposal that aren't even letting us know they exist. This is yeah. very problematic, especially what we've witnessed happen in the past couple of years. I do not think that all of my wonderful human beings around me are as dumb as I just witnessed the last few years. I do not believe that at all. I don't. I have much greater faith in humanity, and I believe there was an outside force that made them lose their minds. Yeah. And I would yeah. seriously suggest that people consider that this technology is that precisely. Yeah. That there is a way to influence, we'll use the word kindly, yeah, there is a way to influence and there is a way to get the product that you want to show up in society if you invest enough. Yeah. And there was a product that was requested the last couple of years. That product was requested to come with a mask. Hmm. And I do not think that the rest of my humans were as to be as dumb as to believe the baloney that was put out. Yeah. I think there was a lot more nefarious intention and technology applied. And I don't care what people say. Now in hindsight, mm -hmm. none of you all wanted to put a mask on. You're so full of it and you didn't protect anybody. And you all <laughs> know it. And you all know it now. So yeah. now in hindsight, why did you all do what you did, you knuckleheads, you? And I will be as so kind as to you. just give tolerance that maybe there was a technology yeah. that was working against you mm -hmm. that you didn't understand to know thyself and you couldn't divine out in your heads yeah. that there was an interfering voice that wasn't you. Oh, man. Yeah. But that technology exists to interfere and to come in and to elude and to suggest. Huh. And this is an investment that can be made. Just like McDonald's said, that they're looking into technologies that can put a dream, uh, put a, a commercial in your dream. This is, yeah. this is the exact same. This is, this is the tech. This is it. Okay. What's the difference? What's the difference if you wake up saying, man, I can go for an Egg McMuffin. Or you weird say, I have to hurry that. up and put my mask on. Right, right. Okay, here. So I'm I'm like rushing to get this 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 freaking question in here because I it's it's honestly it's totally cringe for those of you guys. Some of you guys would be like, "What? That's dumb, Matthew." But maybe other people won't. And this is a long wind up intro here. And so, you know, right around 2020, all of a sudden during the height of our COVID madness and the mind virus was kicked loose and who knows, maybe the ice cube neutrino detector got turned up to 11. 
a lot of people within what we might call the soul group of individuals who are monitoring the goings on of the predatory AI influence on the earth plane. Some people were talking about how there was a huge experiment that was unleashed on the consciousness of people on planet earth, primarily on Maine, you know, and on the American continent to influence our behaviors. As we know, the mask uh, thing was one of them, but there was another thing that made no sense around that time that people clamored for. They went crazy for it. It had no bearing on reality. There was no earthly need for it in a world of sickness. And that was the great toilet paper rush of 2020, which I know another researcher, I think it was Cyrus Parso was talking about how that was actually an experiment of mm -hmm. a, a passive mind control program that was delivered through our mobile devices that was mm -hmm. linked to an artificially intelligent cloud network that was being set up in the atmosphere that was being guided or controlled by physical structures underneath the earth. Mm -hmm. And so it stands people, to reason that could be, anyway, yeah, the ice cream. A thousand room. percent. People yeah. need to understand that they don't need to understand an experiment being plagued upon them. Just because somebody else can think of it and has an intention, you don't need to understand the whole situation to realize there's something going on. As an example, when I was at the South Pole Station for the winter season, I had access to a particular bookshelf, which had, which had the winter over psychological research studies from 1957, the first year they had winter overs, up until 1994. Oddly enough, here's a 1994 situation. 94. So in 1994, they said they stopped doing these research studies on winter overs. But mm. I was reading all of the stuff from the previous years and witnessing that everything that they were doing in those other studies was happening in my winter. Yeah. So they said they stopped doing it, but that wasn't true. Huh. One of the things that I noticed that they talked about in this process of prodding and probing and researching the psyches of the winter overs was in the company store. So the company store at the South Pole, right? You can go rent DVDs. Oh. There's, you can buy cigarettes, you can buy booze, you can buy deodorant and toothbrushes and shot glasses that say South Pole station and just miscellaneous stuff, right? But you're at the South Pole for the entirety of the winter. And what I read was that part of the studies was they would change the prices on things in the store during the winter to see what you would do right there's no point to changing the price like all of a sudden like raytheon needs to get 15 cents more for a package of m&ms huh like they're losing money on the south pole station crew prices need to be adjusted that what are you talking about so we could make ends meet down there yeah totally right so but in reality was they were changing prices just to see what that did to people it was a stupid dial to turn but it was a blatant one and these are things that matter and what people don't pay attention to in real life is that all the world is a stage and they don't pay attention to when dials are being manipulated on them right right i totally agree i totally so there's agree. so many times where these studies are occurring in some Stupid dial is being turned just to see. Huh. So maybe the toilet paper rush of 2020 was one of those dials getting turned. Exactly. Let's, you guys, let's go see if we can make them go buy toilet paper. Yep. Don't worry, guys. In a couple of years, we'll make them go crazy over baby formula, too. That'll yes. be great. You know what I mean? That or is all that was. They, we, don't, we don't need to understand all of the things that they were testing in that. We just need to understand that it certainly was not genuine as presented as face value. It was shenanigans from top to bottom. Someone was up to something. Yeah. They were playing with us. It was a game. Yeah. Okay, here here comes another question. We're just gonna we're we're, we're just gonna keep them rolling, and mm -hmm. you can give me a really huge signal. And I'm seeing go. zero chat on my end to pay attention to. Just so you know. What? What's that? I'm not seeing any chat on my end to pay attention to. Oh really? It doesn't it doesn't show up on your screen. It does not show up on my oh, end. Really? Or wow. I would be happy to be helping more. Oh wild, wow. Okay, well, luckily, actually, here I will say it again. If anyone has a really important question for Eric. 
please insert it in there. I thought you could see the chat as well, so I sincerely no. apologize. I think Actually, you can. You know what? Hold on one second. Let me see if I'm making an error here. I think you can click it on the on the right hand side, or maybe I just have the different view. I just yep. Hold on. Yep. There's a private chat and another comments thing. Oh, I'm loaded there. up. Okay. There we go. So we got we got some chat stuff going on. Here 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 comes another question that um. I know you mentioned this in another interview, but you talked about kind of the Havana syndrome uh, symptoms that people were mm -hmm. were sort of getting. And it's wild because I remember when they first started talking about the Havana syndrome stuff a couple of three, four, however many years ago it was, it was right around the time when I, I was beginning doing sort of like psychic work and healing work. And one of the things that I noticed about it instantly was I was like, this is not a natural occurrence. This is some sort of technological thing. It's a literal weapon that's being put on these people. And I maybe you mentioned this in other ones, but what, were, were there people at the South Pole that were having symptoms of that? Like some of the scientists that were working on it? Like what, how did you put the pieces together where you were like, huh, I wonder if this is also causing those things? Like, this yeah. was a this was a long time coming. It took me a while to connect the dots. Um, my winter site manager, Renee Nicole Dussieur, this is referenceable. It made the news at the time. She was con. She was how do I put it? She was looking for help outside of the station. She believed that she had a stroke. I believe that she believed that she had a stroke, mm -hmm. and when anybody believes their life is in danger they do what they can to survive i don't knock her for anything that she did she felt she was in harm's way and she did what she had to do what she thought was to survive huh. i will again emphasize i believe that she believed she had a stroke what did she time. have to do to survive though why do you say that she was calling for help she was scared Okay. She was wounded is what happened. So like when someone like an animal, like you just, you do what you have to do. She, she got wounded at the South pole station and yeah. she realized that she was hurt and she started to try to figure out what was going on. She huh. then tried to identify and diagnose her circumstance and she laid it at, she believed she had a stroke. Hmm. She did get off of the ice. It was determined by John Hopkins University, they do not believe that she had a stroke. Hmm. I don't discount that she had fear for her life put into her and she was suffering symptoms. Yeah. I believe she misidentified what her symptoms were. I believe that she was simply just suffering Havana syndrome symptoms. Yeah, an energy weapon. Uh, because she went public, I will leave that as a public aspect that I believe she was directly impacted by Havana syndrome symptoms and just simply misidentified it. I will say that there were other people on my crew that I have communicated with that have not gone public, but I would say mm -hmm. that through our communications, we believe that we were also attacked, that our facility is a top secret offensive capable facility. Our enemies would know that not mm -hmm. our civilians, our enemies were returning fire my crew was negatively impacted in a war that most people don't know exists. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So part of that was from the neutrino ice cube detector, or do you think those symptoms were coming part from of, else? I don't, I don't know enough about the technology and how much we've been lied to. There's a high probability that the detector is detrimental to people in proximity. I have no reason to believe otherwise because of the experiences of the people that are now in proximity to it. Because I know that we were either negatively impacted by the technology that we were in proximity to or in anti-technology. That much I know. Mm. I know that the people that wintered with me at the South Pole Station are suffering the same symptoms as the people that we now define as Havana Syndrome. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is all playing with words because we're discussing Havana syndrome and it would be analogous to like discussing bullet wounds and never discussing the gun. Right. Right. Who shot Havana you? Havana syndrome is the bullet wounds. Yeah. Yeah. What a weird conversation to have when you just discuss it from that angle and nobody ever addresses yeah. the implement. Well, where did they get their Havana syndrome symptoms from folks? 
when the DOD came out and gave an avenue for all DOD personnel to now run up the chain of command and the symptoms and the attacks. Well, that would be analogous to them saying, well, you know, if you guys got bullet holes to report, here's a form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I feel you. But we're not going to talk. No one seems to want to discuss the gun in this equation. Huh. Interesting. Speaking of the gun in this equation, actually, not speaking of that, it's a total non sequitorial question. But anyway, <laughs> here, here it comes. Anyway, one of the other highly placed, we could call them elder statesmen or previous figureheads. We could call them the old flag, you know, the 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 old guard of the. Uh, we maybe we'll call it controlled ufology. I'll just say her name because I don't give a shit. Linda Moulton Howe. She's kind of a gatekeeper or she was a gatekeeper on the Antarctica scene for a little while, bringing in a bunch of um, some questionable and some very authentic experiencers. They, they, they sort of talked about how, and you know, granted, I realize this is thousands of miles here, but they talked about how there's this massive opening down there in the ice and you just fly your plane over it and there's this big hole into the inner earth. Did you experience or hear about or hear any talk or even see anything like that when you were in Antarctica? What do you think about that story, that there's a big hole into the inner earth there? I did not see that. I can only attest that I had full purview of everything. Yeah. I know some people like to say, well, there could be a hologram covering it. Yeah, cool. But then that doesn't explain how some people claim to have seen it. I guess the hologram was off. Basically, I think a lot of people make a lot of claims and society should scrutinize their claims as much as they do mine, is my opinion mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. I make claims, but I then provide documentation. I see other people make claims about Antarctica and get a free pass. I find that wildly intriguing. Shocking to me that society will suck up bullshit so fast. Right. Well, because I think so and so said this and so and so said that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, interesting. There's no truth to the statement at all, but I guess it sounds cool. So let's share the link. Yeah. Seems to be to me what's going on in society. I'll be completely honest with you. I reached out to Linda Moulton Howe and a bunch of people. I've reached out to all kinds of people because I've been to Antarctica. And every time I discuss Antarctica, people turn to me and say things like, have you spoken to Brad Olson? Have you spoken to Linda Moulton Howe? You know what? I have spoken to Brad Olson. Brad Olson's a nice guy and he has experiences in Antarctica. I reached out to Linda Moulton Howe too. I don't think she's ever been to Antarctica to the best of my knowledge. And she completely tried to discount my testimony because it didn't support her controlled narrative. Yeah. That's yeah. the facts of the matter. I keep trying to tell folks that this is very frustrating to me. I understand the confusion that other people might have. I understand the uh, inability to discern the truth about Antarctica from other people's perspectives. I get that. They haven't been there. They don't know. I spent a year there. That's actually really abnormal in yeah. Antarctic experiences. Brad also went to Antarctica as well. I believe he spent a few days there, six days, 16 days. Uh, you know, it just is what it is. Yeah. He spent 366 days in Antarctica. So if you're a researcher on the topic of Antarctica and yeah. you're not looking to talk to me, you're a con job. Well, that's sort of the problem with people with authenticity in our in our soul group is mm -hmm. it, like if there's a gatekeeper or a figurehead or somebody around it, they're going to step mm -hmm. over the authentic guy over and over right. and over again. And they're going to grab right. the dude that says, well, they talked about this and this. They checked off all the boxes from so and so's right. video. And another insider right. said that. And another person said that. And they knew so and so. And they did an interview on this. And it looks like he was in the military. So, oh, dude, it mm -hmm. must be real. Clearly. Yeah. You know, I'm one participant. As well. so I'm there one go. participant from the United States Antarctic Program, and there are Antarctic programs with many other countries. There are real people that spend real time on the ice every year. How come these Antarctic researchers can't ever seem to find one of them? Not one. Yeah. 
They just get these shadowy figures that can't come out and give their real name. But trust me, I vetted them and their story's true because doesn't it sound cool about the spaceship that got turned on underneath Antarctica that's warming up Antarctica? Well, that's what's going on is the spaceship. Oh, do you have pictures of it? Oh, no, we can't take pictures. I was there in Antarctica and I saw it, but I can't take pictures. Oh, really? Because when I was in Antarctica, you know what everybody had on them? A fucking camera. Yeah. So you know what? If you can't show me a picture of the hole in the earth, you know what? I understand. But you better show me a picture of you on the ice. Oh, there you go. I understand that certain pictures might be limited, but don't tell me that you didn't have a camera every other day that you were there. You don't have any pictures from when you were there? You don't have anything that you can divulge? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of baloney to me. Sounds like a lot of COINTELPRO stuff. Sounds like a lot of controlled narrative that when folks like me step up and say, hey, you know what? There's mind control technology down at the South Pole Station. That's the truth of what you need to be afraid of. They don't want me saying that. They want everybody to go, UFO, UFO. Oh, did we say UFO? Did you hear UFO, 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 UFO? No. Nope. Oh, you want to find out what's really going on in Antarctica? Talk to Linda Moulton House. She knows about the UFOs and this, and it's warming up and blah, blah, blah. What a bunch of fucking baloney. Yeah. No, I feel you. I she feel might you. have been useful back in the day. She might have had good intentions back in the day. But you know what? You brought her up, so I'm going to put her on black. No, please, feel free. No, it's that totally lady cool. is a yeah, gatekeeper be beyond belief. Be real. Because be real. I spent a year in Antarctica, and she doesn't want to talk to me because I'm not a physicist. When I told her what I learned about the ice cube neutrino detector, which what you and I just communicated, it was apparently over her head and she was looking for corroboration from a physicist that what I was saying didn't matter to her. And I tried to express to her that the compartmentalization of the physicist being as what it is, you can go speak to any of them that you want and they're going to tell you what they were told. Yeah. That's how this works. That's the whole idea of me coming out and saying something contrary. <laughs> it's the whole point of this. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the reality is, is that when folks like me try to break through the gatekeepers, they do the best that they can to lock the gate and shut me down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've been to Antarctica. Linda Moulton Howe's never been near it. Why do people listen to her on the topic? I think of it like this, right? Yeah. Your name is Matthew Mornian. You have a house and you have a family. Imagine if I started going out and started talking to the world about what it's like in the Mornian house and like being a Mornian, but you know that I've never been in your home and I've never been part of your family, but I'm now pontificating on the topic. Wouldn't that seem really weird to you at the very least? You can appreciate the confusion of other people Mm -hmm. that they don't know that I'm a charlatan. Right. But from your perspective, what do you do? Mm Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where I'm at right now on the Antarctica topic is I see a lot of people talking about a place that they've never been to and they have no idea how to discern someone who's being genuine about the topic or not. They have no clue. Anybody, anybody can show up with military paperwork, right? And say, I was in the military. They can prove that. You can oh, make, by the way, you, any, faction, any faction can also manufacture paperwork to, yes, for a cover story. Yeah. Right. So, so all these people are like, oh, I checked on this and I checked on that. Yeah, yeah, it all sounds really cool. I, I Thank you for your due diligence. But if they want to get bamboozled, the CIA can make a guy that looks like he has a DD-214 that says mm-hmm. he was in the Navy. Right. Now, just because that guy was in the Navy doesn't mean he was in Antarctica. Right. But these researchers don't seem to understand that. Just because somebody can say, I was a Navy SEAL. Okay, cool. Tell me a story. You can tell me a story about anything on the planet. But unless you got pictures and documentation, just because you can verify you were in the military, doesn't mean you're honest. Yeah. We have all kinds of factions all over this planet providing propaganda, which is lies, yeah. to oh. promote what is considered the better interest of our nation. Yeah. So just because somebody approaches a researcher and hands them a certain amount of information, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. I mean, we got Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon lying through their teeth right now. 
Oh yeah, thank you for thank you for mentioning them. I think it's the first time they've ever been mentioned on this channel because they are utterly irrelevant to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but this is, this is the world that we're in. Is that we have shenanigans like this going on, and this is the the average Joe actually has to learn how to swim through this sea of BS because it's not actually up to folks like you and me to point out the truth all the time. It's a matter of educating people to have this divining rod within themselves to get back to that point of being able to understand the truth when it exists and a lie when it's presented. Yeah. Dude, oh, yeah. Okay, I have, I have some immediate follow-up questions to that. Since we're talking about truth versus lie, gatekeepers versus authentic experiencers, we're talking about, you know, the figureheads or the talking heads that show up on the screen versus the ones that actually go and do the work. I think you and I are very similar in the sense that, and, and you know, I say this with authenticity, we are generally the, the archetype of individuals that actually are the ones that go and do the specific times of, types of work rather than the figureheads that go and stand up there and like talk about it on the screen. You and I are the type that will actually go and experience it. I mean, we know that about you. You went to Antarctica. I could add a whole bunch of, you know, things in my life as well. And so given that you've been there, given that you've experienced it, here comes a few questions. Number one, a lot of people talk about it. We just hinted at it. There's some bunch of ships there. They're, they're under the ice. There's pyramids there. When you were there in Antarctica, did anyone ever reference or talk about? Was it a big secret? Was it a you should never talk about those things? Was there any talk of hidden technology or stuff like that while you were there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really straight. There was not that much talk about hidden technologies and things like that when I was there. It was right. kind of very just you know, it was a mission, so to say. What right. I will say that there was scuttlebutt, a rumor. Okay. Mm. This is, a, this is a truth, right? So this is one of the things that frustrates me. Okay. Mm. Is that so in 2010, I was on the ice. Okay. And I'm not saying this didn't happen, right. but in 2010, I was told a story of scientists. This is like Antarctic folklore, right? right. Oh, did you ever hear the story about the scientists that went out to the remote camp? And they came across this thing. Oh, and they got lost out on the ice and people couldn't find them. And then they eventually were found and they got picked back up by a rescue team. And they were like mutes and they were so scared about whatever it is they saw. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's a, it's a legend on the ice. But I heard that in 2010. Okay. I keep hearing people present that same story post-2010 as if it's new. Yeah. So I believe there are just simply Antarctic participants. Trust me, I've met them. They're scoundrels. They're messing with people. Yeah. It's that simple. And the researchers don't know the difference because they've never been to the home and they don't know the family. Yeah. I do. So I know the story. I know it's been around. And I hear people getting played with by a story that I know has been around since Moby Dick is a minnow and it's probably just folklore and society is being presented as something tangible. And yeah. it may be, it may be, but it's certainly not being presented as real because the contemporaries that are presenting the story are not following the actual timeline. So right. they're apparently up to shenanigans. I would know that I've been to the ice. Yeah. Okay. Someone's messing with these people. It's all good. Maybe that story actually happened. But it didn't happen in 2012. It didn't happen in 2016 because I heard it in 2010. So it's just been rehashed. Just they're been... just rehashing. This is they're yeah. getting regurgitated stuff. Yeah. So and so said. I you hear about that. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. So here, here comes another question. Sorry to interrupt you, but here, here we go. Another one of the big things, and here, here's the thing. This is the part where I, I have had what, well, I'll just say it, I have had what I believe to be direct out-of-body experience within Antarctica. I did not ask mm -hmm. to go there. It was an experience that I had. I was shown inverted, inverted pyramids under the ice. I was shown a group of people. I was shown the indentation, like a crack in the ice. I was shown that it was near the coast where they entered because where the big crack in it, it was near the water, and they went in through this massive crack, and they were on this little craft or something it was like a motorized vehicle and it went through this sort of craft in the ice like a canyon 
And after a while, they went up on a little hill and then they went down into this big tunnel and it curved off to the right and there was lights within the tunnel. There was all kinds of stuff. There were railings within there. So to me, when I look back on it, I'm like, well, I think that means there were people that had been there regularly. And what we were shown within that space was that there was a series of, it was like an archeological dig site, but it had been, it feels like it had been there for a long time and it was within a, a like a cavern. So there was a roof to it and there were three inverted pyramid structures. Now there is what we would call a, a regular, I don't know if it was regular, there's a pyramid on top that looks like a pyramid, but inside the pyramid was inverted. And what I was shown there was that there was a group of individuals that had been visiting that place in Antarctica. I don't know how often, I believe this was in about September, October of 2021. Um, and there was a group that had gone down there and what they were doing was doing some sort of a ritual or a reactivation of the inverted pyramids in Antarctica. And I, I got to watch this. It was a man and a woman, a woman stand stood on the outer edge and a man walked down a spiral staircase in the inverted pyramid, meaning he went from the top and went down this spiral thing all the way down to the apex of the pyramid, which was like this. And with, mm -hmm. within the apex of the pyramid was a pedestal. Some of you guys are going to get a telepathic version of this. Sorry to interrupt in a weird way, but you can watch my left eye. You'll get an internal slideshow version of it. But in the apex of the pyramid was a little pedestal. And on top of the pedestal was like, well, one of them, I believe they, they, they did some sort of a, they put a body on it. It was like a, I'll just say it. It was a spike and they would sacrifice people and put it on it. The other one was a dish with water or some form of liquid. Here's the thing. I don't know what they did in there. And I have to also be really real. Who knows? Maybe it was a very vivid, detailed hallucination. I always leave room for well, let, that. Let me refresh your memory from the SSP yeah. conference in Grafton. Yes. Part of the evidences that I had on the table there present for everybody to witness as cold, hard facts. I had a massive panoramic photograph. Yes. And the... Go ahead. Say it had the pyramid in it. So it is. There is a pyramid there. But here, here. this is I, I presented this. I have a photograph. But this is these yeah. are things. These are facts. These are documents. These are people with real experiences coming out of the ice that are yeah. trying to get the truth beyond the gatekeepers. I have presented to humanity. I came across from the program a photograph of a pyramid in Antarctica. I've already disclosed this. It's on my website. People can look at this. The, how come the, the world, how yeah. come the researchers that are saying they're concerned about these topics and trying to discuss them when the real facts are presented, why are they mute? Where are they? Yeah. It's they say they're looking for these things. Why don't they engage when presented, when the truth actually exists? Mm-hmm. And this is kind of why I came out of the shadows is because I saw a lot of conversations going on. I'm very much a supporter of the underdog. And I looked around the world and I saw a lot of underdogs that were, I would say, challenged in life by programs they should never have been forced to be part of as children. And I watched what became of them through the years. And I started to realize that I had an understanding and that it was my obligation to break these chains of bondage on the children of our society. Yeah. Because that's what's effectively going on with all of these programs, all of these lies, and all of these deceptions. The big picture for the SSP program, the big secret that nobody wants to discuss because it's so painful, is we're selling our children through the cosmos. Yeah. It's true. It's That's true. the cold, hard facts. That's the rough part. That you want to fix things on this planet? That's the problem. Yeah. Our children are a product. Anybody who promotes that, go fuck yourself. Nice. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Here, here comes the, I guess, the the rest of that weird long-winded question I was I was trying to give you. So given that, you know, maybe people like myself have had weird experiences where we've viewed things in Antarctica, given that you've been there and 
You've seen mm -hmm. the I, I saw the image that you brought out on the table. Literally, it's all pyramid right there. And for those of you guys, I think it's on your website, right? Is that it is. Website? And I and I apologize because I know it doesn't go well over media. But you know what? That's not how this this isn't how life works. Right. When, so, when, yeah. when 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 tidbits of information come out, they don't come out the way you necessarily want them. Here's the cold hard facts. I spent a year in Antarctica. I have a roommate who spent even more time in Antarctica. She got this photo from someone in the program from the ice. This photo is now off of the ice. It's a huge, I've never seen a panoramic photo as big in my life. I've never seen one half as big in my life. Guys, it's like six, seven feet long or something, right? It's like 16 feet long. It's like 16 foot long is panoramic. It? Yeah. yeah, it's off the wall huge. So it's not meant to show precise details. It's meant to show a whole geographical panoramic, and it then labels it accordingly. Any human being standing in front of this photograph will understand exactly what I'm talking about, which is why I show it to people. Over the internet, it doesn't translate as well. But this is why I bring it around and show it to people. Any human being I have showed this to looks and goes, oh, my God, there's a pyramid right there in the mountain range like it's late it's literally labeled just like everything else you have mount this and mount that and mountain top this and but then in the middle of it all it just says pyramid and everyone can see it and that's why i show it to people because these are the facts yeah so the pyramids are out there what do you think about the idea that there are a number of multi-mile long ancient ships encased under the ice what do you feel about that i think all possibility exists always. I hope someday someone proves that statement true. In the meantime, it's a cool story. Cool story, bro. And I think a lot of folks are getting really caught up in the stories that they're preferential to coming true versus the cold, hard facts that we actually have to deal with. Yeah, and that's yeah. COINTELPRO to me all day long is that there are factions that are uh, they have the pulse of the attention of society and they know how to play with that yeah. and that humanity we're extremely powerful creatures individually and especially collectively as a creative force and our attention being attacked by somebody else's intention matters. When somebody else can make us all pay attention to one thing, that is creation. Totally. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Mic drop from Moniac. Thank you. Thank you. Boom. No, I want to no. give a shout out to Tim out there. I saw in the I saw in the comments Tim yep. from the convention was, was yeah, in there. So fun. Tim oh, was a great here. guy up, that I met. Tim? What's going on, Tim? How's it going? I see. There you go. There's Tim. Oh. Tim was a great guy, and one of the reasons why I love these conventions because we get to meet great human beings. Tim was an excellent human being. Tim, thanks for all your hospitality while we were out there. Oh man, that's awesome. Good to see you, Tim. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for thanks for being on this on this weird broadcast today. Um, I think there was a there was another thing we were going to mention about your experience. Oh yes, tell us if you can about the Alaskan Triangle. There was a show that you had did some work on. There was a thing. That, yeah, tell tell us tell us yeah. about that. We're going to go from Antarctica to Alaska, everybody. So here we go. We're going to the other side of the world. Yeah, the other side of the world, but same situation. Totally. gatekeepers and the power of the edit. Yeah. So I got contacted by the producers of the Alaska triangle. They had produced one season and due to COVID related stuff, they were having trouble getting season two dialed in. So they reached out to me and asked if I would help them out with a production out in Ketchikan, Alaska. And there was reports of USOs, unidentified submerged objects and other secret things underwater was the question. And they wanted to know if I would be willing and had the skill set to go out there and find that stuff. I agreed. I was happy to take the mission on. Really? We went out there and I recorded with the camera crew. We went out onto the water and I got the sounds that they were looking for. I got clear audio of activity under the water. I recorded it. I got video of me 
showing the captain of the boat, you know, the acoustics, the recording equipment, same thing with the cameraman. Unfortunately, they edited out everything that I found and made it out like I didn't find anything. Yeah. Which is how the gatekeepers work. This is what I'm trying to get at, folks, is that, you know, I'm a real person with real experiences that's really telling you they're really lying to you. Yeah. yeah. You know, I went and did a TV show and then they lied about it. I went to Antarctica, they lied about it. I was in the submarine service, they lied about it. I went to school, they lied about it. I mean, what at what level of my life was I not lied to? And all I can do is try to present to people the disinformation because I know it firsthand. And I don't think I'm special in as so far as having been disinformed. I think I'm special just because of awareness. So like you were involved with the tag and the gate programs as a kid. I believe all of us are being processed. There is a savage beast of an industry oh, yeah. that starts at youth and processes our children yeah. up to and including sale off planet. Like products. Every aspect of these products, these children, mm -hmm. this valuable commodity, no stone is left unturned totally. for this process. Yeah. And people can think that they're choosing their lives, but boy, oh boy, the programs, the forks in the road mm -hmm. that exist before you were manufactured. There's not a choice than anybody's making that isn't on a manufactured path. Mm, do you, but, make a left or make a right. Yeah, feel free on the roads that were built for you. Yeah. But do you think there's people who aren't, who have diverted from those pre-made, pre-existing paths? Of yes, existence? and they're few and far between. All possibilities mm -hmm. exist always. Um, I, I, I know people that have been able to operate outside of that dynamic their whole life. The yeah. system sees them as invisible. There are mm. folks that don't use Facebook, folks. There are folks that aren't on the internet. The yeah. metadata for them is a fraction of yours. So the system doesn't attack them as much. It doesn't know they're there. They're invisible. I feel like I'm kind of invisible. Well, not so much anymore, but... I see Mr. Ron Dale has a question about a yeah, 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 pyramid Ron. by Denali. Yeah, that would I have be, heard of this as well. In fact, I think there's an arc structure, but what do you think about it? I believe he's referring to Mount Hayes, which is an area that I've also been up to to investigate. There's a lot of reports of UFO activity there, and then there's also remote viewers of the past. I believe Pat Price and some other big-name folks have stated that there's basically some sort of intergalactic spaceport under Mount Hayes. So it's Mount Hayes. That's where that is. That's, yeah, that's it's near Fort Greeley, which is a missile facility here in Alaska. So I think it's very interesting that right, you know, for all practical purposes, Mount Hayes is in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Alaska. Yeah. And all of a sudden the military decided, oh, no, 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 we need to throw a missile base right next to that. Yeah. So there is a pyramid out there, you think? That's my understanding is that a lot of folks have gone in that direction. And that's, that's kind of why I went there to look for myself to try to get eyes on target. I did not see anything peculiar on my last visit there, but there's enough reports that it's definitely worth you know, taking a look at. I wish I could go out there. I want to know what it feels like. For some reason, with this, you know, to add more weirdness to it, the... Alaskan pyramid one was also something that was shown organically to me as well. Um, mm -hmm. That one's actually shown up to a lot of remote viewers out of, out of, I don't know how to put it. It's like, I guess when people go in to look for stuff, um, sometimes stuff looks for you. Yes. Yeah. Literally. It's literally true. Anyway, sorry. Go on. Go on. Yeah. You know, so that's, that seems to be the issue with Mount Hayes yeah. for a fistful of remote viewers. It's like they're trying to do their thing thing and this other thing is like no 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 i need your attention oh man thank you for saying that i have encountered this with a number of things and i've been trying to explain it to people i'm like you guys there are structures in this world that want you to psychically view them they are sitting there 
in a dimensional mm -hmm. space with a signature that's streaming out of them going, see me, find me. Yeah. They're waiting for people to literally hone their abilities so that in which everyone has them so that they can perceive these things. And so anyway, thank you for saying that. But yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's one of the things, too, that um, our enemy knows this. Right. So there's mm -hmm. the powers that be that try to deceive, misinform, hide. But then there's a karma thing. Right. So it's like in a way, the more you try to hide something, the more it becomes a beacon on a certain level. Yeah. So for the right people on a certain paradigm, something can get hidden. But on another dimension, it, it makes it shine brighter. And that's a karma thing. So the people, the bad people, in a way, they can hide it from the majority for a bunch. But in that activity, there are certain seers that then through the hiding activity, you're making the seer see it more clearly. Mm -hmm. Totally. Literally, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you mm -hmm. for articulating it as that because I am a wholehearted believer in that it's like the more they tamper with it the more it's viewable and um mm -hmm. yeah that's that that's very good to know i'm just going to throw this up on the screen thank you mom tendo cs she says shortly before the conference i drew a picture of three mountains with crystal pyramids that had inverted base bits boom there mm -hmm. we go thank you mom tendo because that's been a thing i've been talking about for a while you know, I leave room for the idea that it could be in a pocket dimension. I'm not one of those people that's like, because I, you know, remote viewed, it means it's definitely there. Trust me, it's not how it works with everyone. We get depictions mm -hmm. and examples of things, but um, that's very and good. And remote viewers can make errors. It's okay. Really? It happens. Well, see, here, here's the thing about me. I have no formal training in mm -hmm. any psychic or healing related things. None. Mm -hmm. Right. Zero. I am the most organic version of just the literal version of it ever because like with the whole remote viewing thing, I, I it was a thing that I accidentally, you know, started doing like with psychic work. I did not know that's what I was. Go I had no idea that's what I was going to do in this life. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's that's a, that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, that's that's very good to know. Is there anything else that you would want us to know? about the connection between, well, maybe not a connection, but about your time in Antarctica, about your time in Alaska. Are there any other facets of Eric's life that you feel you would like to talk about or just mention or just anything else about you, even if it's on a totally different subject? Because I just like to leave I, I, it up to anything you want to bring in. Anything? I think in a way, um, not so much about me per se, but about what I've learned about me to maybe help other folks is that a lot of my path has been by i guess being critical of my own memories we should be i think the most of my growth has come from challenging my own recall of things That's a good and idea. what i really want to do is challenge other people to follow me in that activity is that i believe that this is a good activity for the individual and for society, because I believe we're doing ourselves a disservice as individuals and as a society by not getting involved in this activity. It's shadow work. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's challenging. But that's the benefit of all hard work is the success that comes afterwards. And I believe in so many ways in this current society, we've been conditioned as individuals to not be doing the things we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And I believe this is one of the things that we should be doing. I'm doing it. I'm leading by example. And all I can do is ask other people to follow me on this path. Respect that you have an experience, but respect that your experience was manipulated by the intentions of others to look the way they painted the picture for you. Mm. Yeah. It's up to each individual to reassess their own life to make the corrections for their own experience. And in any society, we should respect the experiences of others when brought to the table and shared collectively for our growth. But if it turns out that all of our experiences are tainted and we're sharing them, it's poison for each other. Yeah. So we need to reevaluate the paths that we've walked, remove the poison from our own experience and then share the truth with each other so that we can grow. Like that. Yeah. 
Thank you. I very, very much agree. I like, I, I have a genuine appreciation for the way you intensely yet very, very openly articulate certain things in a manner that I'm I think trying. everybody can reach it, like in a way where it's, it's very accessible. Honestly, it is very, very much, but um, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to put a couple more questions on here. I know we've been hanging out for a while, which I always say we're not going to do every time I'm like, it's only going to be an hour guys. Just a real quick question from Gail Emmer. She says, you mentioned metadata being collected on all of us. I get the feeling that an AI digital version is being created for many of us. Ah, yeah. And these AI dupes can influence our consciousness. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to start out with that one. Gail, I totally agree with you. Um, I won't say much more, but Eric, what are your, what are your views on that? What do you think? I, I, I agree 100%. I think that there are... Um if not in mass, at the very least, there are pilot programs on this where they are trying to make um, reasonable, reasonable facsimiles thereof. So there will be a Matthew Mornian um, avatar in a computer somewhere that some government program is trying to make this thing out as much like the real one so that they can then probe and prod and be like, well, if we did this, how would Matthew respond? Mm -hmm. And just by simply doing this through the interfaces that are available right now that Matthew currently integrates with, we could mold his mentality by editing the information that's presented to him. It's that simple. Yeah. This, all of this already exists right now. The question is, is to what extent is it being applied? And the more we research and kick in doors and try to decompartmentalize, we find out that there's bad people with grand intention. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We yeah. learned about Facebook just a little ways back where they were talking about experiments where they were supposedly being selective. They weren't mm -hmm. doing it to everyone, but just to see if they could influence. Like, you know, so if Matthew had a page and they said, oh, we want to see if we can get Matthew to post more negatively. Maybe they could. Do Absolutely they could. They learned that they can just edit your friend's feeds and yeah. give you more negative stuff. They, they figured out a process. They could make you make more positive posts if they wanted as well. But either way, it was a matter of understanding manipulation. Yeah. All they have to do is turn the ice cube neutrino generator up to 11 and boom, next thing you know, I'm posting about, you know, I don't know, what is it? I'll, I'll use a prohibited keyword. Next thing you know, I'm posting about QAnon on Facebook. Boom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Watch yeah. Out. Next thing you know, they turn it up to 11 and Matthew Mornian's like, Joe Biden, we need him again. Totally. Go yeah, for Joe. Out. I'm, I'm Go for Joe. We're, we're yeah, if I see you with your Joe awesome. Biden 2024 shirt on, I know that they've cranked that thing up again. Dude, I'm, I'm going to be doing Joe Biden until 20, 2042 or something like yes. that. Forever. Yes. But it'll be by Dan, B I D A N. You know, by Dan. I don't know what people's problems are with dictatorships as of late, you know? No, no, it's cool. Everybody's everybody's doing it nowadays. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we need to, you know, maybe we need to try communism the right way, you know? Yeah. That's always the one that comes up. Because everybody just seems to not be able to get it down correctly. They're just not doing it the right way. Right. Just give up all of your, you know. Mm-hmm. All of your money, all of your uh what is it? You will you will you will owe nothing and you will you will love it. Um, who knows? Yes. Maybe, maybe that'll happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I certainly hope not. I think we've already defeated a lot of the mechanics around that timeline. We'll just need to live through the next, you know, six or five or seven years or however long it takes for us to kind of like, you know, move that timeline out. Or maybe it'll get way worse in the meantime. But um, anyway, one more. We got one more question because they Go asked. For it. It Go for it. Go for it. They asked it a couple of times. And actually, I, 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 I would like you to meet. Oh, here, here it is. We found it. The eye drops. We were, somebody went back to the eye drops. The, mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah. What can anything else you want to add about that? What was that experience like? Was Ooh. there a feeling? Did you get a vapor? Because you know sometimes you'll get. I don't know if this happens to other people. I've received eye drops before, and I've, I've gotten a taste in my mouth. So I don't know. Maybe that's normal. Maybe it's not normal. But um, you know, it's 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 hard to say. I don't I don't know that I do have more of a recollection on the eye drops than what I've stated. It was um, it was followed oftentimes by um, a, a visual training device. 
So I often wonder times, you know, was that something to do with it as well? That, you know, that in a way it seemed apropos at the mm-hmm. time to justify the eye drops, you know, from my child perspective, again, these deceptions, yeah. um, so that it didn't cause a red flag to go up because uh, lots of times there was a machine that we would look into and they would put videos and images in front Mm -hmm. of us and there would be questions and things like that as well. So I guess in a way, I believe as a child in my brain, I was thinking to myself that they were giving me the eye drops so that I could keep my eyes open longer so that I wouldn't have to blink. But I mean, that's kind of in hindsight, silly. You know, it wasn't that mission critical for me to not blink. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like it was it was part of a subtle like conditioning process where they were interjecting something into your system that allowed you to either view or interact with non-physical energy, whether it's visual, auditory connection, mm-hmm. you know, in entrainment, as they say. And, you know, that's just me kind of, you know. Like looking at it was, and there was, there was, um, there was also headphones and sound effects and stuff like that that I remember too. There was like a hemi sync thing going on. So there was oh, I wonder absolutely, if you guys in the gateway program. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, straight yeah. up. Yeah, the, absolutely, straight up, a thousand percent. So oh. I have, I have gotten hold of the recordings of yeah, the too, gateway program, yeah. and there was a time when, as an adult, I was listening to the recording for the first time. Mm-hmm. What I was having, like, you knew like yeah, you knew what was yeah, happen. like as they were as they were saying it, I was like, I know what they're. I already knew every bit of it, and I was kind of having a small heart attack at that time because that was a, it was a solid reality that I couldn't take away. Like I, I, I now knew as an adult that I had memories of something from when I was a kid that was nefarious, and that was kind of like a like a harsh moment. Like it was like, oh. all right, this this already happened. They did this. They did do this to me. Yeah. Oh man, I feel you. I feel you. I'll be honest. I would, I would like to experience those eye drops at this stage of our like human life and just see like what, what happens? What were they doing? One mm-hmm. of these days you and I, maybe, maybe you and I will do a session and we'll sort of look back on some of those timeline elements in your life, but. Oh um, yeah. I'd be, I'd be cool yeah. for that. But um, anyway, yeah. here, here we are as, as you can probably tell, we've been here nearly two and a half hours, which is always the, I'm always like, we're not going to go that long. But that said, first off, I want to thank you for showing up, for telling your story, for being real, for being raw, for not pulling punches, for saying it like it is, for talking. I mean, just everything that we have talked about here today, Eric, I'm in complete agreement with you. I feel like we've done this in other lifetimes. I feel like there's been some kind of involvement you and I have had in some other in some other place, in some other time. I feel, I feel the same way. There's, there's, there's. All I can say is I feel like there's an odd connection. Dude, totally, totally. That we need oh, to man. figure out. That's totally. all I can say is we need to, we need to figure it out. There's, a, there is an odd connection, and we should figure it out. Totally. I, I look forward to exploring that with you more in the future. And I pray to God there's another event in the coming months because I would love to mm-hmm. hang out with y'all again. And who knows? Maybe it'll mm-hmm. be in the wilds of Alaska, but. Um, I got my fingers crossed that I might be able to pull something off. I was wholly inspired by the efforts of Aaron and Tyler, the Journey to Truth podcast, what they accomplished in Grafton, Illinois. My hat goes off to those gentlemen. Totally. It was an amazing event. Totally. I've been to so many of these, probably, mm-hmm. and some of them were horrible. And th- yes. it, was, it was far and away number one best social interactive experience we've had at some any form of a conference or gathering. Yes. Number one, absolutely. So yep. yeah, I can I can see that in this topic of disclosure, there are folks that are simply working in industry. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of that going on actually. Totally. But what happened in Grafton? was not profiteering. Yeah. It was real disclosure. I want to help support real disclosure for the real whistleblowers. And there should not just be this profiteering on the top end somehow. I don't really understand the industry entirely. But what I do know is that there's a lot of people that have truth to share and it shouldn't cost them money to share their truth while someone else is profiting off of that. That seems very wrong to me. I agree. 
I agree. It feels like both you and I have had a similar wave of maybe we'll call them difficulties in getting our story out in the ways that we've wanted or being received by the, mm-hmm. we'll call it the social milieu at large. You know, we've both of us have mm-hmm. had our own in individual kind of issues there. I, I very much uh, resonate with just your experiences with like the gatekeepers and the just the people that don't want to listen. And no matter how mm-hmm. authentic you are and how real, and you're like, oh, I was actually there. They're like, oh, well, you're just a plumber. What do you know? Hmm. Anyway, let's talk to this guy. He yeah. He was a, she was, he was a trigger puller 25 years ago. He knows something, you know, and it's like, I have had very much, very similar experiences, you know, whether it be with conferences, whether it be with shows. I think you probably heard this. I started this show literally because I wanted to be on other people's shows and nobody would give me the time of day. I'll say one show would journey to wow. truth. They were the only there ones. Dude, they would talk to me, but literally nobody would. One of these days. I like, appreciate oh, that. I yeah. appreciate that position. That's, that's the exact yeah. same angle that I'm on is that I'm trying to, you know, knock on doors for people that say, oh, these are the conversations that I'm an expert in. Yeah. And then I knock on the door and I I get the cold shoulder. Yeah. You get that in the Antarctica realm. I get it in the psychic training and spiritual healing realm. They're like, what? You're not working with, you know, Arcturians. You're not putting a column of light around your body. You're not telling us that ascension is happening now. And all we have to do is wait and, you know, wear this yeah. robe and grow our hair uh, long and, you know, do these chants. And, you know, it's like, I won't get chosen. Hold on. What you're saying sounds very negative. I have to raise my vibration right now to protect myself exactly, from you. Exactly. Like if you're yeah. authentic and real, if you have an actual process with which to discuss and, 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 and actually information to back it up, you are more likely to be ignored in favor of someone that shows up with the outfit and the look Mm -hmm. and the 20,000 people on YouTube, which you can buy for the record, everyone. You could literally, I can buy 10,000 subscribers tomorrow if I chose. You know what I mean? You will get passed over time and time again in favor of a flashy, you know, story. And so Mm -hmm. I, 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 I really feel you on that. It's a, it's a weird experience being a completely authentic underdog in this strange realm that we're in, because no matter how real you are, only the other people who are able to actually gauge what is real are going to go, Oh, Hey, Oh, that guy. Oh yeah. Let's go talk to Eric. He knows something, but everyone else Mm -hmm. will be like, Oh, you look cool. You're saying the right words. You're checking off all the boxes from so-and-so's blog. You're authentic. You know what I mean? So anyway, watch out. I'll go on a big, long, bitter rant. No, 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 no. I, I just, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir, but I appreciate it regardless because those are the facts of the matter. And maybe the rest of the folks don't know that, you know, yeah. this is, this is a very peculiar environment that I decided to dip my toe into. So to say, oh, I yeah. really thought that I would take my facts and present them as a, real person with real experience. I thought that I would drop them to the public and walk away. Yeah. That they would, that the facts, you know, that the truth would speak for itself. It's not true at all. The truth doesn't speak for itself nowadays. There's a, there's a giant industry of mechanation fighting against the truth, getting out there. Yeah. The easiest way to find that machine is to present the truth and then watch what attacks it. Oh, totally. Then the machine presents itself. I've done very well with this since I've started disseminating information is to just simply drop down a piece of information and watch who attacks me. Yeah. Let's see who comes after this thing. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Watch who says that I'm a liar and doesn't know what I'm talking about and why should we believe him? Hey, what's up, troll? Right. You know? I think it's hilarious when people are like, this guy's a liar. He's probably never been to Antarctica. Yeah, cool story you got there, but I have. So now what? <laughs> yeah. I like that's the ultimate trolley thing in the world. In my opinion, it's a good thing that they will call you a liar because, like, dude, for me, they won't even acknowledge me. They're like, huh, what? Oh, we won't even answer that email. You know what I mean? Totally I'm understood. Least, yep, that's another technique. A liar, you know? <laughs> yeah. I welcome anybody to engage me in the topic of Antarctica. Any researcher, anybody that wants to talk about all of the things that are potentially going on down there. I'm not opposed to any of the potentials. I'm welcome to dialogue on what's really going on, though, and what can be supported and what humanity needs to be concerned about, because there are threats. But I want to help people. I don't like watching people get sucker punched. 
Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. And I definitely don't like when my friend's about to get sucker punched and somebody else is misinforming them and telling them it's all right. Yeah. 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 I feel you. I feel you. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out with us here today. I know we have been here for quite a while. I pray that we get to do this again in the future, but you got it. How can people find your information? What's your website? Do you have any events or any, just anything coming up? What can people take part in? Okay. So currently the best way to follow my, my facts are at deciphering.tv, which is my website where I have the archives and the documentation to corroborate what I'm saying. I also have a presence on YouTube, which is censored as everybody knows, but deciphering my experience on YouTube. I do have an interview coming up with Laura Eisenhower. I'll be chatting with her on Friday. So I'm really excited about that to discuss again, the directed energy weapons and how they've been impacting her and her life experience. So that should be a lot of fun. I have another interview coming in the end of June with, I believe it's the UFO man, which is supposed to be a big podcast. So I'm trying to just get out there and connect with folks that are open to all possibility and the facts. I mean, there's gatekeepers aplenty. There's probably more gatekeepers out there, folks, than there are truth speakers. And unfortunately, it's the lack of discernment that keeps those folks in power. So please come to Ciphering.tv. Please check out my work. Please support folks like Matthew and any other truth speaker out there. You have to like, you have to subscribe, you have to share. There is no federal government disclosure coming. It's never going to happen. Lying all of these years. The only thing that they have afforded is an unlocked door now for folks Mm -hmm. like myself and Matthew and other whistleblowers to just help get this disclosure thing going. So if you want to see the truth, get out there. You, we, the people have to share it. We have to stop waiting for it to show up on our doorstep. There are people discussing it. There is information out there. Like they said on the X-Files, the truth is out there. It's always been out there. We've always had aliens and UFOs. Just because the government's now admitting to it doesn't mean it just started happening. It means they just stopped lying about it. Yeah. So stop trying to look to the liars for your new truth and do everything that you can as individuals to promote the new truths that you're coming across. Help people like me, help people like Matthew, help anybody that you believe is spreading the truth. Help them. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, It has been an honor discussing all these wild things with you. Like I said, I look forward to doing this again. I'm gonna go ahead and pull you off the screen as we do our little outro here. But uh, you guys, please do check out Eric's work in the coming days and weeks. We've got a couple interviews coming up. I genuinely look forward to seeing how those how those will turn out. Um, absolutely. And so in the meantime, uh, for those of you guys that are watching, I do want to let you know we're going to be back on, I think it's June 18th. I think we're going to do a live on June 18th. And then we got another show two weeks after that. And so I'll be doing some announcements about how that goes, when that's going to happen. In the meantime, please subscribe to Eric's work. For those of you guys that are here, I think, I don't know, maybe we're still about 40 people away from hitting 5,000. So if you're lingering in the background, do us a favor and click subscribe on this video, um, even if only just to get triggered in the future. And you can uh, you can just cancel me from your life. But in the meantime, I want to thank everybody for watching the School of Multidimensional Intuition As always, you guys, you can find me at rememberyourmission.com. Private sessions, private energy clearings, and private readings are the literal heart of what I do on an every single day basis. Um, And so you can reach out to myself and my wife, Anora, through rememberyourmission.com. We've got some other stuff coming up in the future, but we'll talk about those on other broadcasts. In the meantime, thank you guys for being here. Thanks for hanging out. Keep it real, and um, we'll be back in the coming weeks. So stay out of trouble, everybody. We'll see you soon.